This was a rather big surprise, wasn't it? Not that I would be a basic bitch and fall in love with one of the most popular RPGs in the last decade. No, it's that I would have so much to say that I would stretch it into a insert word count here script. Hold on, wait a second. Persona 5 is just a fun time. While the game has some flaws that are fixed in the royal version, there's just simply too much to say in a traditional review. The game means so many things to so many people, and that's rather remarkable given Atlas's track record. Oh, Golden, you sure did try. Over there on the PS Vita. What is with Japan and handhelds? I genuinely want to know that. Then again, I could say that several times in this video, but I digress. A lot of people say that this game has a really intricate plot and that the characters are extremely deep. And while I agree with that, eh, there's room for improvement. And that's what I want to look at today. What the series has done so far and where its strengths and weaknesses lie. Not only for the base game, but for Royal, the TV show, Strikers, and even Dancing in Starlight, because I don't know, fuck it, why not? So join me, won't you, as we look over the legacy of Persona 5. You are stronger than all these that made you weak. So we got strong on sleep. Don't it feels to be real like no. Tap this reason to break all this in your mind. Take my head, join the team. Gonna let that dead leave fall down. Hey, start to rise up. In my flaccid attempt to be balanced, I'm going to cover my general opinions and all that jazz just like I did for my Kingdom Hearts 3 video. So obviously the game is going to be at 30 FPS because there's no reason for it to be at 60. It's a turn-based game for God's sake. I played on normal because I'm basic and don't want to kill a motherfucker over getting one-shotted by a Hispanic chick praying for my soul five times in a row like she did in my first playthrough. So that was fun. Oh, also I was on New Game Plus for all of these games because I just beat them all for the first time in March of 2021. So basically I was focusing on confidence and achievement hunting rather than going for stat buffs. I will talk about all of those things at the same time, but just know I didn't go out of my way to get footage to get better stats. All right, on to the best and the worst of the games. Onward. Favorite palace, the casino. Favorite phantom thief, Makoto. Favorite friend, Mishima. Favorite adult, Sojiro. Favorite boss, Akechi. Favorite confidant to go for, Shania Oda or Caroline and Justine. That one's hard to choose for, but we'll explain why later. Least favorite of all of these, Shido's boat, Yusuke, Yoshida, Kamashida, Okumura, both versions, and lastly, Oya. Oh yeah. All right, with that plethora of hot takes done, let's get on to the art design. Persona has a rather interesting history, at least in my mind. See, the game was originally set to come out in the winter of 2014 or thereabouts, but was delayed for one reason or another. The interesting part comes in from a completely different game, Catherine, a puzzle game. This weird dream-based block-pushing puzzle game was essentially a tech demo for Persona 5. It has the same art style, same aesthetic, and same character movements that will live on in P5, and even has something akin to social stats and the morality mechanics at the end of each floor. There's the cocktail trivia that lives on in Sojiro and his coffee tips, even the movie theater plays tracks from Catherine when you go with friends. So it's safe to say that Catherine has a massive influence over P5, and it's for the better. Catherine basically gave the devs of P5 a free test run on how the game looks and feels to control. People ate Catherine up, which which indicated to Atlas that this was a good art style. In any case, with the, oh, I don't know, six years between when the two games were released, and that the hardware got better and was able to put more polygons up Joker's nose, however, it's not like this game is going to push the PS3, 4, or even 5 to its limits. It looks great, but it's about as taxing as putting Chibi Robo on the Switch would be. I'm not better Nintendo. 
Also, before we dive hardcore into this, you cannot tell me at the very minimum, Vincent, Catherine with a C, Catherine with a K, and Orlando don't look like Joker slash Kamajita, that's a scary sentence, on Sai and Ryuji respectively. I swear to god, they all look like fucking relatives, they even give off the same vibes. Hell, even Atlas themselves acknowledges with the Catherine costume DLC, which, yes, I did buy for a two second side gag, what of it? Anyway, my point is that Catherine is an integral part of this game's development, and to ignore it is to ignore the significance Da Vinci's sexuality had on his art, considering the reason that we have a white Christ in modern society is literally because Leo painted his boyfriend. The modern depiction of Jesus is an Italian t the graphics of the game are nothing to write home about. Like I said a moment ago, because the game was made for the PS3, it's not going to strain the later consoles with how beefy they are. However, the art design is something I absolutely love. The rather anime come to life feel gives it a longer lasting impression on the viewer, unlike something like the Final Fantasy VII Remake, which already a little over a year later had to have a fucking graphical buff because of all the shit they put on screen and the amount of pixels they put on every rock, twink, and hair follicle on screen. And I still find that hilarious. One thing I do give P5 flack for, especially since it was 2017 and it was delayed three times, is that character animations are fucking awful outside of combat. Now, I get Akira. Oh, by the way, I named my base self Akira and my royal and striker self Ren Amamiya because I wanted to be able to tell the clips apart at a glance, plus they are the canonical names for the protagonist and Damn it all, I hate seeing my own name in games, because it creates so much dissonance, especially in a social sim, but we'll cover that more… later. Anyway, I get Akira having canned animations, like this weird hand gesture thing or whatever, considering he isn't voiced outside of random bits of dialogue the story gives him, or him giving out attack commands or calling a persona's name. I love hearing that. That's understandable for him, but everyone else? Well now that's just lazy. I'll cover confidants in their own section, but here's an example from Makoto's ninth rank. She's had enough of this one girl shit and hauls off and slaps her. Now you can probably hear her say the line that's on screen, right? Well, that scene is unvoiced. One of Makoto's most badass moments loses some of its luster when you can't hear her amazing voice actress smack a hoe with all the conviction this moment deserves. Only the first and last rank of each confidant are voiced, which I find hilarious given that for the women, rank 9 is when you start dating them, so you'd think they'd want that moment to land a bit more than the canned voice lines they have reserved for half the game. I get why the confidants aren't voiced outside of the story mandated ones because most players will skip them. I know I sure did my first go through, but for those of us who don't read that well in a limited time frame and want the emotional impact of these scenes to land, why not voice them? Animations are also a problem I brought up earlier, and now I'm going to elaborate on this more. I know the game has very few, if any, real cutscenes, and thus most of them are the in-game models doing these canned animations that are only like that so that you can do dialogue options and rank up their affinity for you, but you could just do it the way they do the boss repenting cutscenes, with a little thought bubble. I'm not asking for super in-depth shit here, but a simple turning animation that doesn't have you walk in place to do it would be fucking nice. It's like Pokemon with this shit. I mean, this is absolutely lazy. There is no other word for it. If we can shit on Game Freak for this, we really should shit on Atlas for the exact same thing. I'm not opposed to canned animations or stuff like that once in a while. Like a running animation for your non-playable characters can be kind of half-assed because typically you won't see them as you're zipping through, so it can be kind of jank. But on stuff that most people are going to experience at least once or twice and is going to take up time in the day, which I will remind you is very limited and precious, put some effort into it. It's not like the palaces take long especially if you do the Doctor Confidant, which gives you SP recovery items that regain spirit points every time that character's turn is up. It saves you a lot more than you think it will. I understand there are like 300 demons or something and you have to program all of that, but they only do one animation each, so I think putting the effort into like the 30 or so named people in the game is way more important than the personas. Ironic, given that's the name of the game. The game has really well done battle and basic traversal animations that are honestly standard for the most part, and again, I understand this was originally for the PS3, so it's going to be a bit less graphically stunning, which I'm cool with, and the animations will be a tad lacking, but lacking should not be non-existent. You know what, let's talk about the art style before we move on, or rather elaborate on it. This game looks fucking beautiful, not just in the cutscenes, but like, in general. This game is so pretty guys. It's so fun to just behold the way this makes my eyeballs go ooh. 
I may be burned out on the story stuff, but aesthetics wise, I cannot get over how this game looks in the slightest. The character designs are really well done, and while I have gripes with some people's designs on Infotaba, I still love their general theming within the game. Unlike with KH3, I don't really have a reason to dispute why the game looks the way it does, I'm more just pointing out my own perspective on it given that I've never seen anyone talk negatively about how the game functionally looks, rather than how it aesthetically looks. Basically, mechanically, rather than dem cell shades. Overall, while I live with the comic book anime cartoon this is going for, and the fact that it will never age a day for years to come, I think it will always be hindered in the visuals given how outside of plot important moments, the game doesn't want to animate its characters doing anything. Again, since the palaces are only like half the game and most people speed run through them, they're left with like a whole month of dead air to deal with the social sim aspect of things. I find it curious they didn't account for this and made that stuff more interesting to experience rather than just looking at it. Do I hate the game for this? Clearly not, but I do have to say that it could have been enhanced much more than it was in those six years it took to make. All in all, Persona 5 looks amazing, has some iffy mechanical animations, and yet, it still has my eyes glued to it for every clunkily turning frame. So it's no big secret that I hate turn-based combat. It's not all that interesting after the first few fights, and it quickly devolves into using the skill or elements or whatever trap card you have at the time to down the enemy and then kill them outright. This can be due to damage multipliers like in Pokemon or the press turn system seen in other Shin Megami Tensei games, or in the case of Persona, the Baton Pass, which I will cover in a moment. Oh, one thing to mention is that for most of this, I'm covering the base game and all the topics in depth, then going to talk about Royal in its own self-contained section to compare to the base game and see how it improved things. I'm doing this because while, yes, Royal did fix a lot of things and made so many quality life adjustments, that doesn't mean Vanilla 5 doesn't have merit on its own. This section, however, will probably be the shortest out of the video because I don't really have much to say other than it's solid all around. Well, it's solid, but can be frustrating at times. Let's start with the good first. I like that you remember what the thing you're fighting is weak to, and then it tells you if it will do something, or you should avoid that particular attack for that enemy. Really makes you reconsider if you want to use two smaller attacks, and then baton pass to what that thing is weak to, so you don't accidentally heal it. Stuff like that really adds up. Confidants even tie into this. Each person in the group gets the same kind of abilities, like making certain negotiations easier if you fuck up, taking fatal hits for you, enduring with one hit point left, and even recovering each other's status abilities in battle, which comes in handy way more than you think it would. Guns get rather annoying at the start before you meet Shinya, because he gives you ammo bags that let you carry more bullets into a palace, and even if you spam the downshot move, your party will never run out of bullets to down enemies with, and it's great. What I don't like about the combat... Well, like I said, it's turn-based, so you have an eternity to do whatever the fuck you want and think it over, rather than thinking on the fly or planning your strategy. Not to mention that you'll get about halfway into a palace and have already fought most if not all the personas in the place, leading to stale feeling battles. This does lend itself to you getting a persona you're after if you're trying to fill the compendium, or if you just need it because it has a skill you're not familiar with yet. It's a helpful system that adds to the combat more than if you were just able to catch things like in Pokemon. I would be making a lot of Pokemon comparisons, so gear for that. Negotiations can be a bit weird sometimes, like in some cases you don't have to be super accurate, but other times you'll have to nail a negotiation, otherwise you'll get a shitty item and then they'll leave. It's a great way to mitigate the problems of past games where it was basically luck as to how you'll be able to get these guys, but here it's very straightforward. I'll save the Velvet Room stuff for the Confidant section, seeing as that's more or less going to be focused on what those three give you to add to the room as the game progresses. All right, back to the positives. Follow-ups, these are fucking cool. Everyone in your team has the option to follow up your attack with a more devastating one that will do critical damage and knock down whoever's there or was there. There are also them just doing normal critical attacks if you have them just barrel on in there with no regard for sanity. I don't know what the percentage is for this to trigger, but I mostly got it with Makoto and On. I mean, yeah, Joker did it as well, but these two were the big ones. <laughs> Like I said, with each party member, they give you specific abilities that help in combat, and while I don't want to talk too much in depth about them here, since that would get redundant later, I will say Ryuji's insta-kill ability is both a blessing and a curse since it makes clearing a room much easier, however, you don't get anything from it besides a mask, which, while fine, doesn't help when A, I have a full deck of masks, and B, they're all garbage. They're not rare or even decent, they're the most bog-standard common-for-the-area's masks that are just not fun to get. Now, if you're clearing out a floor in, say, Mementos, to wait for the Reaper, it's fine, takes maybe a minute, but otherwise it doesn't help, especially if you're grinding for XP or money. I get what they were going for, but there's just something that could have been done to refine it just a tad more, but we'll get there. So remember when I said the baton passes would come back? Well, we're doing it here. I have one teeny 
tiny niggling problem with them. They're fucking optional. Yeah, they're completely missable on like three of your party members depending on how the story goes. Yusuke, Makoto, and Haru are able to be in your party and be part of the system before you start their confidants, which means the Baton Pass, the rank 2 ability, is unusable until after you leave the metaverse. Well, okay, that makes some semblance of sense. You can't just have them have the ability before you start their confidant, but at least you can start it after you secure the treasure, right? Right? No. I'm not entirely sure about Yusuke, but I know for a fact that if you secure the route to Kamashita's treasure, Makoto will not talk to you until you steal it. Why? What is the point of this? I know you can't hit Kaneshiro with a super effective attack or anything, but you can at least do something in between the palace and the treasure. What if you wanted to go in and grind or go to mementos or something? This basically shunts you into either doing her beforehand or starting her after, which is just stupid. Again, it's not like their abilities are super great or anything. Like, I don't think I've ever used Yusuke's card ability, and it's not like I can't date Makoto in the rest of the game's time frame. But honestly, it's just annoying one of the game's main central combat mechanics is locked behind something I might not get to before they're needed for the boss fight that represents their character arcs. And I know Haru is worse, believe me I know she's worse in this regard, but I'll have to save her for the boss section seeing as that's where her confidant faults really shine. You see what I mean when I say this game is good on its surface but gets frustrating after you think about it for a minute? It's stuff like this as to why that is. Gear is another thing I'm kinda up in the air on and how to categorize seeing as it's mostly Velvet Room stuff, however it is battle gear so I'm gonna stick it here so we can get the full package. Gear is great, it's simple to get a hold of and if you're on New Game Plus or going for a perfectionist run of the confidants, you can pretty much much get all the best gear besides Akira's knife, seeing as Sat's Isle is locked behind New Game Plus, which I think is really dumb. You don't get access to Justine and Caroline's confidant until Madarame's palace, and you don't necessarily have all the personas saved correctly. At least I didn't, which we'll get to later. This base confidant forging allows you to get discounts and make personas of a higher level than you. That sounds great, still a bit pricey, but there's still another wrinkle. You don't get the electric chair, that being the itemized persona thing, until you beat Futaba's palace. Not a specific date, but only when Wakabu is dead. So if you didn't get the best gear for the rest of your team at the end of your first playthrough, you're fucked until, at a minimum, August 2nd for even starting to get better gear. I understand progression gating and having smooth difficulty curve and all that, but you carry over weapons as it is on New Game Plus, so once you get the tutorial or awakening fights done, you go from normal Joe Schmo to smacking with the hand of God in less than a minute. So why not just unlock the Velvet Room stuff during Kamashita's Palace in New Game Plus since you have the world card from beating the game initially? I like gear, and I like the way it's used, it's just how late in the game you get the electric chair that pisses me off is my point. The combat in this game is great, but it's nothing new. It just added to the already existing SMT system that was set up back in the early 2000s, and it just added a fresh coat of comic book paint that makes my eyes thankful to my brain for subjecting them to it. I have little gripes here and there, but nothing that'll break this game for me. Is it flawless? No. Is it fun? Not every minute of every encounter, but yeah, it can be. My biggest change to the game would be giving you the quality of life stuff earlier in general, but especially on New Game Plus. The big problem with the game is that it gets repetitive in a hurry, and its combat adjustment systems don't unlock until far too late in the game to be fun on subsequent playthroughs. Sure, on the first playthrough you're like, oh cool, what's this thing? But afterwards you're like, wait, why am I waiting this long to get this thing when I know I want it or need it sooner? I know I'm splitting hairs here. I'm just giving my thoughts as I see them since I took notes of these things as they became apparent. That being said, the mini bosses and scripted fights are where this game really shines. Outside of the tutorial, that is. The only other thing I can think of that legitimately pisses me off delves into boss territory. So why don't we move on to those and the palaces they've created. This section is going to be an amalgamation of several different things, those being the palaces, their owners, and the basic layouts of the place with the puzzles inside, because I feel like these all mesh together well enough to warrant this idea. Again, for transparency, here's how I rank the base game palaces. This isn't a black or white thing either, it's more just how I feel when I remember the palaces and how long they take to complete. For me, one of the base aspects of the game that kills the replay value is how much it stops you from playing it, or that it has you watch like a two hour movie in the middle that you can't even walk away from to grab a drink or something for fear of a prompt that'll come up that will halt the game forever if you don't hit anything. I know it's a dialogue heavy game, but it absolutely kills certain sections of this game for me. Not to mention that you can't toggle auto advance on outside of the pause menu, so for everything after size boss fight, it just turns into a button masher. 
and not in the fun way. For context, I played this game for the first time in March of 2021, then I played Royal and Strikers in a row, so I had to experience the story at least twice in a row with some flares in the second time. Then I played the base game again for footage collection, maxing out all the confidants and basically platinuming the game. But my Elgato kept corrupting the footage, so I had to get OBS to record it again, which worked, but if you're counting, that's still three playthroughs of the game 100% and listening to the same conversations three times for what feels like an eternity. Royal didn't really help much, seeing as I had to make sure there weren't some conversations that were added to older scenes, like the one right before school starts again and y'all suddenly talk about Kasumi. This is why Kamashita is just not the best, and I'm actively baffled when people say that his palace is the first. It's a tutorial, and yes, the story is more interwoven into his palace until you return with On, at which point you can blow through it pretty consistently. However, that doesn't change the fact that Kamashita's palace takes two in-game weeks to do, and that's including the boss fight, which itself is a one-day affair. Okumura's palace has the same problem, in that there's just like a three-hour block where you can't do anything, you can't see people, you can't go anywhere, you just have to watch people talk about vacation, boys and girls they like, and all the other shit that I simply do not care about. I'm not saying this is inherently bad, but it's how the game frames it. From August 21st, you are basically locked into watching Futaba become a better person, going to the beach with everyone, which comes back later, striking a deal with her, going to dinner with her and Sojiro, and then have maybe three days of free time before there's five days of high school stuff, followed immediately by like another few days of confidant stuff, one mission that you have to do to start a confidant, and if you haven't maxed out Kawakami, which you almost assuredly can't because of the weird time restriction they place on it, you can't do anything at night, so again, more time is wasted to start Shinaya, who is one of the best confidants in the game. And wait, cause we're still not done. The beach day comes back since Morgana and Ryuji fight there and that sparks a bigger fight later, which takes more time. And yes, I am aware that during the nights of the days you spend helping Futaba, you can hang out with your night confidants, but most people focus on Sojiro as it is, so that's more Sakura family drama on top of it all. I swear to you, I dread playing September in this game every time it comes up because there's just so much nothing to get through. And I know, I'm the guy that loves character interactions, and if you're dating one of the girls, you get a genuinely nice scene with them. And yes, a lot of the things that happen here are funny, but it still gets on my nerves how much time is wasted not being able to make progress on the things the game tells me to care about. Time is limited after all, and while I can plow through the palaces in the minimum amount of days, that doesn't mean I should be okay with being able to just do nothing for days at a time. Even if the cutscenes are long, just let me hang out with someone after. Also, Morgana is gone during the fight with Ryuji, so you literally can't do anything but save and go to bed. It's so stupid! Alright, now that that's out of the way, how do the palaces themselves bear? Well, let's start with the king himself, Kamashita. I won't let anyone take this. This proves that I am the king of this castle. It is the core of this world. Kamashita is just one of those palaces I tend to not enjoy for one reason or another. I know we just talked about the game stopping you for no reason other than because they say so, however Kamashita will just not stop stopping you from doing anything at any time to explain how to mechanically do something the game had you do in the fantastic intro. You already know how to summon your persona because of the scripted fight, and you already know how to ambush or hide because the fucking game has you do it as part of the opening as well. Which is fine since, yeah we have to tell people on a new playthrough, but if you're on New Game Plus like me, just give us an option to skip the tutorial fights. I'm not joking when I say playing this tutorial again feels like the one in Sonic Heroes and Morgana is Omo Chow. Having Morgana say, hey Frizzy here, you already know how to handle your persona and a gun, you're quite accomplished for a newbie, and moving the fuck on would have been perfectly acceptable. I do not understand why this thing has you start and stop constantly. Just let me explore. The palace itself is pretty solid, I normally don't like how tinted red everything can feel, but here it's rather nice. The decadence and the royal theming is something I wish more games did. I'm a big sucker for castles and games. The more medieval inspired but still its own spin on the trope, the better. The enemies are plentiful, and there is at least one of every kind of magic that someone is weak to in the place, so you always have options to damage another shadow somewhere else. Practically as a dungeon, I love it, and even if I take a step back from the repeated playthroughs, I like the diegetic tutorial aspect as well, despite the fact that I always get bored around the time you get on, but the game quickly frees up after that, so again, I can't really complain afterward. I will say for the first level, this place has decent secrets and a fairly amusing puzzle here and there, but most of all, the colors are what stand out in my mind. This is something I'll talk about as we go, but something the last three palaces don't do 
that the first three do is color theming really well. Kamashita as an antagonist is extremely smart. He's so personal of a threat to your new friend and your new life that having your school gym teacher be the first real boss fight is so smart and so well thought out that I have no notes. The boss fight is rather easy, especially with high level personas, but that can be said for every boss in the game. None of them really have a difficulty spike if you fight through the palaces normally. The bit about stealing his crown making him infinitely weaker is a great way to show how fragile he is. I thought that was a neat touch. Not to mention, the value of art is all subjective. I make the rules in the art scene. I am the supreme being. I am the god of the art world. Madarame is a vast improvement over Kamashita because it allows you to more or less explore uninterrupted. Yes, there are two times the game makes you leave, once in the beginning and once to do the scripted section the next day, so I count that as one overall, and then the boss fight. It's great. The museum also flows really well. It feels like two distinct segments that deal with different aspects of Madarame's ego. First the gallery of his students who he made a profit from, then a segment of paintings that deal with his inner feelings, and then a fairly amusing puzzle about picking the right version of Sayuri to progress, or get it wrong and be forced to fight. Here I remember more blues and golds and everything shining, contrasted with the mellow music and how it feels like a day trip to a museum because of how nice the music is to listen to. Not saying this is my favorite theme, but it's a nice one, and compliments Yusuke and Madarame in a very nice way. The song, titled A Woman, can relate to how Madarame is still focused on this one painter who made a spectacular piece that made him famous, and that her son is his star pupil along with the fact that that song is about Yusuke's mother, which ironically has the same kind of thing happening in Futaba's palace. The fact people say the palaces are less interesting because they focus on the villains, not our main cast, is dead fucking wrong. These palaces are just as much about our teammates as it is about the rulers themselves. The boss fight for Madarame is actually really clever to me. Three segments are weak to physical damage and gun, whereas the mouth is weak to all types of magic. However, the caveat is that if you hit the segment with the opposite attack, it absorbs it and heals, meaning that you can't just spam hit all moves on a standard run. Not to mention that you have to down all of them in one turn, otherwise they'll revive each other, something they would use to infuriating effect in the just and Caroline fight. I didn't get around to it this playthrough, but you get this black paint that makes them take massive damage by any kind of attack, but again, I just used Riot Gun and then everyone else's magic attacks. Madarame himself, by comparison, is less interesting. You just wail on him a bit and then he summons the painting again, rinse and repeat till death do we part, and boom, the fight's over. It's a satisfying encounter since it gives Yusuke some much needed closure to the man who let his mother die, but mechanically, it could have had one or two things thrown in to make it more interesting. It doesn't matter whether you're clean or dirty. Only the clever come out on top. The strong and the smart devour the weak. That is the natural order of things. Kaneshiro is honestly the least involved villain in the game. He's literally a filler palace while we get from one to the other. However, I think that works to his benefit and Makoto's. It's no surprise Makoto is my favorite girl in the base game, and she has one of the best awakenings, but we'll get there. Kaneshiro is just a face to punch, because he just so happens to rope in students from your school, and Makoto, being the student body president, was ordered to get involved. Which now that I think about it, is A, illegal, and B, a horrible misuse of power. Hey, here's a weird question nobody thought to ask. Why wasn't Principal Kabayakawa a fucking target? I know Kaneshiro is a more immediate threat, but at least Kabayakawa could have been like a mementos request by Makoto or something. In any case, I'd argue he has much more need of a palace than Kaneshiro, because while Connie Boy is a mob boss with a massive greed streak, he really could have been changed as easily as this guy's from Iwanai's story. But no, we deal with a rando with some cringe dialogue because big stakes, I guess. Hell, the whole thing about the Black Mask Persona user would have been better served here, because he fucking knows who Akechi is, or at least I think he does, but whatever, back to Flyboy here. Despite everything I just said, I like that Kaneshiro is such a hateable ass. He's someone for Makoto to focus on punching the shit out of without feeling bad about it. She was told to stomp him, so she'll stomp on him to do it. His palace is also one of my favorites. Not that it's complex, it really isn't. It's split into three phases, the top floor, the basement, and then the giant log puzzle section. Each floor serves as a ramp up in platforming and puzzle solving in a more obvious way than the rest of the palaces in the game. To me, this seems like a more natural tutorial place given how it teaches the base mechanics and its overall theming and gradually layering it throughout. It's no casino, but hey, it's a good place to start this. Something that the first two palaces lacked was a sense of escalation in their puzzles. The room puzzle was just a reskin painting room and Kamashita had the ram heads and the bookshelf stuff. The word puzzles here feel really well done, and while I can answer these in my sleep, it's still a really great idea. So, can we talk about price for a second? This song kicks so much ass, it's hands down the best palace theme in the game. And no, that is not up for debate. Winds of Fate? 
trash. King Queen Slave? Garbage. When Mother was there? Bitch, I never knew her. Glad she's gone. No, shut up. Not gonna argue this. This is the best, and it makes me jam the fuck out every time the chorus kicks in. It also fits with the Kodo so well because of its punchy nature and how energetic it is. Before I gush too much about this, we gotta move on. The boss fight I actually died to on my first go way back when. I didn't have anything to defend against Gun, so I got killed, went and got Oni, and then came back and won like it was nothing. The Piggytron actually has a gimmick I can show you. Crazy, isn't it? If you give up an expensive item, Kaneshiro will be distracted for two turns, letting you get some free damage in. There's also a roll attack, which if you kill Kaneshiro on top of the pig, it's basically a free round. Overall, it's a solid boss fight. Not the best, but it's better than some will get to later. Also, the whole place is tinted green. I like green. You were used. They forged her suicide note and laid the blame of her death upon you. They trampled all over your young heart. Get mad. Don't forgive those rotten adults. Futaba. This palace kicks ass. This palace, more than any other, sticks to its theme in a way that seems more literal. With a casino or a yacht, there's only so much you can do with that, even though they are cartoonish exaggerations of those locations. A castle can be kind of played around with, and even a bank is able to be exaggerated with to a certain degree, but a pharaoh's tomb? Now that is where we get into the fun territory. Unlike the rest of the palaces in the game, Futaba bears no direct ill will to the group. She just so happens to be able to deal with the people who are using her domain to fuck with you, and in return, she wants you to work your magic on her. It's a solid goal, especially since it's the first palace to not add in a new party member into the whole thing. It simply tests your skill at that point with the six people you have already. Her puzzles are probably some of the more memorable since they add to her character rather than just reinforcing things we already know. Like with Kaneshiro, and that he's an insecure man-baby who uses money to solve his problems, and that his tough guy act is just that that, an act. Or that Madarame is a thief, or that Kaneshiro is a predator. You know, just basic shit about their characters. All we know going into the palace is that Wakaba is dead. That's it. We learn how she died and why Futaba blames herself, to the point that the final boss is the embodiment of the lies people told her about her mother. Speaking of her mother, the song When Mother Was There is a legit bop despite what I said earlier, although it got a fantastic remix in Starlight. The puzzles are... Honestly, more of a focus here, and I think that's due to Futaba's autism. For those of you who don't know, I also have autism, and I'm sure some of you just had some things click and others are still confused on what I'm even talking about. To boil it down to an absurdly simple degree, autism is a mental disorder that affects one's ability to deal with social nuances and be a functional member of society to a variety of degrees. It also comes with a lot of other things, such as a blunt tone, an obsession with things you find interesting and thus will only really open up if given the opportunity to explore that said thing, and overall just a really bizarre way of living a day-to-day life life. Now this is only if you have low sensory needs. If you have high sensory needs, that's something entirely different we're not going to get into today. It's relevant here and now specifically because puzzles and RPG mechanics are like breathing to most autistic people, especially those of us who are gamers like Futaba. Her palace has more actual puzzles layered throughout and backtracking to make sure you don't just blindly keep doing the same thing that it shows her off to a T. For example, you have to get these orbs from the Anubis statue, and the first one is kind of a freebie. The second one looks to be the same, but if you grab it before going to trigger the switch which opens up more of the area, you're met with an arrow trap and are forced to put it back. It's a nice touch that veterans of these types of games would get a kick out of, and it's a good way to incorporate it into her character. I can't really not talk about Futaba as a character entirely because... Well, she's the palace ruler, but I will go more in depth about her later, but we do need to talk about Wakaba. Honestly, I love this boss fight. It's not only Futaba's awakening, but it's just a cool idea. The first phase is using elemental skills to deal damage while not dying, then when Futaba comes in to save the day, you're able to use physical abilities that do a shit ton more damage to her. Like, I think if you use Concentrate on Bala or even Yoshiitsu, you can kill her in one round. It's just so fucking good, and one of the only times you need to use the fight's gimmicks in order to win. So, I actually have footage of it. Solid encounter. Can't be mad at it. The next one, though... We need to have some words about Okumura. Overcome failure at any cost, even if it means betraying others. That is our family motto. The cold reality of kicking people down is part of business. Virtues and sentiments are for losers. What happiness can be found in acting with justice but losing the battle? Okumura is... Honestly, not the worst palace. 
It's certainly not the best, but it's definitely not the worst either. I genuinely can't remember the theme to the place or even how it's structured. This palace, more so than any other, has such disparate areas that if you looked at them apart from each other and didn't have knowledge they were from the same location, you'd never guess they go together. I get why this is, it's supposed to be the way Akumura wants people to see the store versus how he actually treats his employees. Makes sense, but the dissonance is still jarring. I don't think the first section has any puzzles in the traditional sense. You just have to ask different levels of employees who have the right bosses so that you can fight them to get a key card. I just fight everyone for the experience. Which leads to the dumbest part of this fucking palace. The green guys, you know, the bulkiest and highest defense enemies in the whole goddamn place, that almost need a baton pass to make sure they don't knock you on your ass, and then the game teaches you that Haru can knock them down in her mandatory boss fight? You know all that shit? Yeah, Haru can't use Baton Pass until mid to late October, given that her entire confidant is based around her father's death. Why this is the case, I will never fucking know. I love Haru, she's a sweetie, and Triple Down along with One Shot Kill are amazing abilities, and she takes up a slot on my team whenever I don't need a specific person, Yusuke, but she's basically useless in this game because Baton Pass powers up the next attacker and extends your turn, which is really helpful for any encounter, and she's the only one that can deal with the heavy hitters in this palace, but you are unable to power her up unless you just grind a shit ton in between. I mean, I already have a persona with a single and multi-hit Psy attack, so it's not like we're completely fucked, but weaknesses deal extra damage so it just gets frustrating. Hell, the boss fight is just waves of enemies that can explode on you if you don't kill them fast enough, so that's just not a big help either. I do like the second half of the palace a lot more because it's just collecting stuff and destroying robot arms to make bridges for yourself. That was a clever idea, and the fact that you have to run through the areas again because you're on a time limit that doesn't stop even in combat is a fantastic idea. The second half of this palace is really fun to me. The vent section I've heard horror stories about, but I like it. It's not that complicated, and if you check your mini map to find which paths have opened after you pull the switch, you'll get through it no problem. Overall, Okumura isn't a terrible palace, but the decisions around it are what make it suffer the most. Haru not being able to use baton pass is one, but the whole thing with Ryuji and Morgana really plays a huge factor into why this palace just sucks when compared to the others. But what better way than to leave off one of the game's lowest points than to go to one of its undoubted highest? When my father died in the line of duty, I hated his killer from the bottom of my heart. Dying to uphold justice sounds virtuous, but the ones left behind have to clean up the mess. Sai Nijima's palace is fantastic. I have very few notes and overall feel it's one of those levels people praise for different reasons, but the overall feel is that it's just a good mix of everything. Mandatory puzzles that aren't stupid and serve the story. A gimmick of not only the palace itself, but also the boss fight that ties into multiple characters. An amazing shadow design that's just so damn cool because it's the right amount of different. The palace taking at most four days to complete with the mandatory stops. It's just so good. Everything blends so well. It's probably the shortest palace with how small it is, but the enemies inside are typically fun to mess with and find out who or what's in here. The Valkyrie is probably my favorite since it embodies Sai to a T, but it's a subtle thing that most people may not notice on their first go through. I'm not really going to touch on Akechi until Royal because he's got so much to talk about and this one's already long as hell. Suffice to say, Almighty is an amazing thing to have on a team, and his abilities being given all at once since he's demanded to level up by the story is a great thing, and I honestly think they did this out of spite for the last palace. Again, the high and low being next to each other is not lost on me at all. When Whims of Fate is a nice duality to Price and Sai herself, since she's all about law and order, but the song is all about letting things come as they may. Price was very punchy and energetic, while this one's... Well, I'm not going to say chill, but it's definitely got a more relaxed feel to it. The boss fight, like I said earlier, incorporates the gimmick of gambling into its first two turns. If you attack her, you'll be brought to 1 HP, something they would reuse for the final boss. But if you wait out the turn by guarding or using buffs from your party, you can bet to allow the scripted portion of the fight to go on and be able to rack up real damage on her. The second phase has her repeat this, essentially giving you free heal slash buffing turns, and I like this a lot. It's probably one of the fairer fights in the game since it plays by its own rules and affects her just as much as it affects you. Sai is the highlight of the endgame, and the fucking Nijima family is what's holding this game together. I'm 100% convinced of this. Again, when I get to confidants, I'll talk more about teammates and palaces. I promise this will all come together. But for now, we need to talk about... Ugh, Shido. The life of a nation, as opposed to those of a few sacrifices. There can be no comparison. The ignorant masses only care about their own personal happiness. I am merely granting that for them. That is the social reform that only I, as the one chosen by God, can enact. 
I'll be honest here, I fucking hate Shido. I understand this is Ren's palace and that Shido is the one that put him here and yeah I know we're supposed to hate him, but I hate him not as a character, but as a narrative device. See, when I first played the game I thought Sai's palace was the last one and that we were just done. I know, stupid thought. But the game keeps going and talking for like two straight hours about everything to do with the twist. Not to mention that I didn't have auto advance on, so I had to actively pay attention since I had to push X every goddamn sentence. Then the game has to reveal his connection to Joker, which is foreshadowed after the Kamoshida Palace nicely, and they do bring politicians up a lot. Hell, I think even Yoshida's confidant touches on it a bunch. However, he's so unnecessary and just a bog standard asshat, unlike everyone else we don't have a personal connection to him in game, it's all in hindsight. If anything he's more Akechi's main antagonist than Akira's, since he is Akechi's father after all, and is using him. This falls much more in line with everyone else. Had Joker not pushed him down back then, we would have no relation to this man or anything going on here. And again, I get that's the point, but it's still not interesting to me. For fuck's sake, Haru was going to be sold off into marriage to an abusive prick if we didn't stop her father. There was some immediate emergency. Here, there is a bigger threat, but nothing personal to Ren. Akechi, yes, but not the person we should care about. The palace itself is decent. My favorite part is the beach chairs that are billfold with his face on it. That's genius. It's not as cool as the carpets in Sai's palace, or playing cards literally raining from the sky, or acting as railing posts, but hey, that's a cool idea. The statues that turn you into mice because that's how he sees people is also a good tie into the character. It's not super deep, but it's a fun gimmick. I always like finding the past unlocked doors to do more of the room puzzles and to get chests. It's a solid idea. Shido's palace is last to me because of its ruler, not so much its design. Although a boat is a pretty boring place for a palace. Said the man who put a bank as the second best palace over a castle, a spaceship, and a literal pharaoh's tomb, but I digress. Speaking of the man himself, the boss fight. I gotta admit, this one is rather nice. It takes things that would later be used in Royals DLC fights and even the Justine and Caroline fight in this game. The first phase resists physical attacks and the second phase resists magical ones, and the third one just taking all the damage. I do appreciate the fact that he uses the masses as a stepping stone to achieve his goal and then tosses them aside when they're no longer of use to him. The fourth and fifth phases just has him progressively turning more and more into Senator Armstrong from Metal Gear Rising Revengeance. To be clear, when I say this is the worst palace, I mean like in the game, not like in games in general. My own praise of this and how it ties into his character should be proof of that. It's just not as well done as what came before it. What comes after though is one hell of a twist. The freedom not to choose. The freedom not to think. If every person pushed the burdens of their lives upon others, nobody would have to act for themselves. And who should be there to receive those burdens? So... Killing God's a thing in this game. Honestly wasn't expecting that. This game's scale is something else, let me tell you. Yaldabaoth is essentially the final act twist villain that recontextualizes the whole game, except not really. You know that typical anime trope that seems cool but after the initial reveal makes you question the point? So basically, to streamline the twist as best I can, Igor, you know, this lovely, handsome, long-nosed, creepy motherfucker with, and I'm not gonna lie here, a sexy-ass voice, is a false god who is observing over Joker and allowing him to be stronger by masquerading as the owner of the Velvet Room because gameplay. I guess I see why, given that he was hoping to rope you into his ideal world, but at the same time, why not just guide him to that goal rather than telling him to avoid the ruin? Just a thought. He's also the reason Justine and Caroline are even a thing, so he gets two thumbs way up in my mind. I love these two so much. However, all he kinda does is sit there and be cryptic, which from what I gather is what happened in the other games as well, so it makes sense for the twist itself, but I feel like him walking around and talking more about other things would have been cooler and maybe made me reconsider taking him up on his offer at the end of the game. The depths of Mementos feel like Persona 5 incarnate, loud, red, pulsating, and just big. The puzzles are actually nice. The floor light path is a good new kind of thing for the game. Not my favorite kind of puzzle, but definitely one that made me think more often than not. The enemies can be rather frustrating if you don't have a good type matchup. Like, I've been killed several times by someone using curse on me when I was weak to it, and then them just spamming me during the ambush. Stuff like that is just not fun. The design of this place is really nice. It has these big black pillars up everywhere that make it feel more put together than it actually is. The final gauntlet though is just... My good bitches, look at this thing! It's a giant spine that you continuously run up and fight literal archangels with Michael being the last one before you fight God. You really want to have an ironic fight though? 
have Lucifer on your team. A good old brotherly spat right before killing Dad is always fun. Yoldabaoth, as a final boss, is honestly really smart. He incorporates the best parts of each of the earlier boss fights. He gets the status ailments from Adorame, the retaliation of Sai, the big charge up attack of Shido that also reminded me of the Piggy Tron rollout thing, and even uses almighty stuff like Akechi. This is what I really like about final bosses, when they incorporate different aspects of earlier fights, and so many games don't do this. They just introduce stuff that is completely random from the player's perspective, and it's just not as engaging as honing the skills you've been working on throughout the rest of the game. Kingdom Hearts 3's Aenor did this really well, and even the final boss of Strikers now that I think about it. The palaces of the game really make or break people's experience, and I don't really have a seething passion and hate for any one palace like I do for say Deep Jungle. Nothing pisses me off, nothing really gets under my skin. At worst, some are just more boring than others. Monorame is probably the worst of the early game, and I've already explained why I hate Shido, but again, it's just kind of stale after a while. I love this game's design and palace layout because it's well crafted. Mementos gets a little wonky since it's all randomly generated, which is why I feel P3 and 4 would not be my cup of tea, it's just randomly generated stuff that eventually leads to the boss fight. Again, I can't pass hard judgement on these games since I haven't played them, but if Mementos is anything to go by, it's not going to be my favourite part. No, I feel like I'd like the day to day shit a lot more. Speaking of that, let's get into how you go from Phantom Twink to full blown Phantom Twunk. <laughs> Day-to-day -day life in P5 is rather in-depth, and while my footage doesn't reflect all this stuff because I was on New Game Plus and wanted to focus more on confidence, seeing as that is where the game has most of its enriching content, even having said that, there were days I had nothing to do besides read or play games or even fish. Stuff like that really adds to feeling like a normal kid in a normal town trying to get through the bullshit that is day-to-day -day life. Even certain confidants need stats to be high enough, like Makoto needs you at rank 4 knowledge to even ding you with her presence, Yusuke's rank 4 needs near max proficiency to pick a lock, Sojiro's rank 7 needs max kindness, Humphu Fumi needs near max charm, and so on and so forth. So your stats do matter. You really can't advance anyone without the right stats. Even Takemi needs it, and she's your first non-party member confidant. The only one who doesn't need any stat building to do is Ryuji. He is just dependent on time. Well, him and Jihaya. Yeah, that's another thing for some reason. Certain confidant ranks are locked behind certain dates. For instance, once you start learning about the replacement coach, you need to wait for Ryuji to find out where he likes to drink, and you can't further the bond anymore. Ushida is locked after November 18th, and even Sojiro is locked until after you chain Futaba's heart. This isn't a huge problem, unless there isn't anything else to do that day. I'm not saying everyone has to be available every single day, but there were several days of just no one being able to hang out, which just fucks whatever you're trying to get done. Now, I get this if you're trying to do a palace run, which I would typically hang out with people until a day where nothing was going on came up, but at the same time, it's annoying when there's nothing to do. No mementos requests, no palace, no boss, you're just stuck doing random shit or taking a nap. Which fuck whoever made the decision to making leaving LeBlanc a permanent one. That is so stupid. If you leave the coffee house of the day, you cannot come back until night, at which point you can come and go as you please like it's no big deal. I know there isn't much to do in LeBlanc during the day anyway, but still, what if I wanted to feed my plant or do a crossword? You know, things that help my stats? The main focus of the day-to-day -day aspect of this game? I will say it is nice that you can read in the library during the day, so you're not relegated to just at night in LeBlanc. There are five main ways to gain stat points. Games, movies, books, activities, and confidants. Each one deals with each point in a specific way. For example, books deal mostly with knowledge. While, yes, they have a wide range in other stat points they can give you, the most common one is knowledge. The games have a good range in stats, but I feel like guts is more common there. Movies, I think, have the widest range in their stats, given the ratio of films to books. Also, who the fuck watches half a movie? Like, unless all these are the Lord of the Rings trilogy length each, there is no way in hell this should take two times a piece to get through. Books, again, those can be rather long and can take a while to get through, but movies are around one and a half to two hours long. All I'm saying here is that the law of equivalent exchange is skewed in favor of books. Activities can fall under anything that isn't reading, gaming, watching, or confidants, such as fishing, training, working, playing baseball, taking a bath, doing laundry, eating burger, and a few other things I'm probably forgetting. Those all increase one stat more so than any other type. They're quicker and honestly kind of fun to dink around with if you don't have or want to spend time with people. Or, you know, can't. 
If you strip away the people you build contracts with, there is still a lot of fun to do here, and it's well worth the time if you want to do a second playthrough devoted to just people, which I highly recommend. This game is great fun on a first playthrough, do not get me wrong, but on a second or third playthrough, it's just so great because you can focus more on the people, which can help you break this game like how Morgana gets his heart broken whenever On denies him. Which leads us very clunkily to the reason we stuff our faces, the lovely people of Persona 5. I'm gonna be real here, I have no idea how to structure this section. There are 21 Arcana in the game, not counting Akira, only 17 of which are optional. Igor, Akechi, Morgana, and Sai are mandated by the story, meaning the rest are up to people's discretion on which one's important. I've already discussed Igor to the point and saying anything else in the matter would be redundant. Sai I found kind of interesting because she's saying she's trusting you more, but bitch, we're under a truth serum. We literally can't lie to you. She's still a great character though. No idea why she gives you a key item at the end of the game, since her only benefit is a Persona fusion and dealing with a catchy. I'll get to her later though, but I just... Ugh, I have so much to say on him, both here and in Royal. Anyway, let's look at the non-teammate ones first, since they're the shortest of the options. As long as you come here for it, I'll give you the medicine at a good price whenever you want. I may even add additional selections in time. I look forward to your continued patronage. Tsukemi is honestly one of the better confidants in the game. She kind of represents the best and worst it has to offer, in her own roundabout way. What I mean by that is that she has such a weird requirement for your stats to get like her third rank, which I can understand given that you need to be tough enough to withstand her drugs, however, it's not like the trials are all that strenuous. We just drink some liquid and then pass out. Other than having a mementos request that bars you from finishing her until it's done, which like half of these fuckers do, she's just great. Her story is compelling, but not overdone. The reason she's in hot water isn't contrived or hand-fisted, she just wanted to help a little girl she grew to care for. That's just a great way to do side stories in a game with such big stakes. It helps to remind us of all the small things in life when they're contrasted to such monstrous people. Her perks only really apply to her shop, but oh my god do they pay off. Her clinic will make her break your run if you don't at least get her to the point SP 2 or 3 are unlocked because while it doesn't seem like it at first, getting back 7 SP every turn is a lifesaver and allows you to make more moves in each fight rather than simply having to use items. I don't think I used many items at all in either game, unless it was for some specific ailment or I was going to get stomped in any other scenario. So while I didn't use a lot of them, I can understand why people would. There's nothing more I can say besides, I'm glad I got to be her guinea pig. I'm sure we'll meet again, if you don't die. Well, take care. Either way, I won't ask you to work for free. If you agree to help me, then I'll teach you how to make the perfect cup of coffee. Not a bad trade, eh? Ah, Sojiro. What can be said about this absolute unit of a man? Well, he's a dad. And no, I don't mean that in a pervy way. He just is a dad. He's strict at first, but the more time you spend with him and get to know him over the course of the game, he softens to you. Hell, he almost immediately softens when you bring Mona home. He's even a little sad he didn't get to name him. It's cute. His relationship with Futaba is just peak good food energy, and if anything, he's the reason I'm sad to leave the most at the end of the game. The people were nice and the adventure was fun, but waking up every day to the smell of coffee and curry with his big old smile to greet me will just never not be the highlight. When you leave him, it feels like you're going off to college or something. It's really well done. His perks? You all know him, you all love him. He lets you make coffee and curry whenever there's leftovers, and these will save your ass almost as much as Takemi, because while her items heal you and restore a moderate amount of SP every turn, Sojiro's coffee gives you 100 to a single member, while the Master Curry gives you 100 to everyone. I mean, that's a little broken to me, because now you no longer have a reason to leave the palace since you basically have infinite SP if you stockpile them in the right amount. One thing I will say about Sojiro and his cozy little coffee shop, I'll always come back. Shouldn't you be saying your goodbyes? Go on. Very well. If learning how to give a great speech is what you seek, then I'd be happy to instruct you. In exchange, I would like for you to continue assisting me. Let's get started, shall we? 
Yoshida is probably one of the most boring confidants in the game. Not that he's a bad character, but given the lack of mementos requests, it's hard to really get a grasp on his conflict. He kinda just runs for office, gets made fun of for his past, and then fucks off once we complete his ranks. There's not even a reason to see him again, unlike other confidants which might have a unique hangout or things like that. You just kill time with them and that's about it. Having said that, his perks are a must-have. They make negotiations with shadows take way less time, and the last rank even gives you the chance to skip them entirely, which I love. There really isn't much to go on about with him. Well, besides how you start his confidant, killing two knights at a shitty job just to show him you're overworked and underpaid makes sense, especially when you have to get all of the orders right in order for him to recognize your struggle. Other than that, he's serviceable. He's not great, but he's not no good either. Please consider them as examples of what not to do. That way, at least, I'll have been of use. There are probably a lot of people who have high hopes for the Phantom Thieves' next move. So, I've also implemented an anonymous poll in the site. Do you believe in the Phantom Thieves or not? I hope someday my forum is filled with supportful posts. I'd really like to help out in the Phantom Thieves' acts of justice. Can I? Please? This boy, this fucking boy, I love Mishima, he is the best boy in the game. He's not the best confidant, but he is by far the best written character in the secondary cast. His confidant is second only to Shinya, and I'll get into that later. However, Mishima grows the most out of anyone, he changes the most, he fucking changes his own heart. Tell me that isn't character growth. Tell me that that isn't something to say is worth a damn about his character. He's your biggest fan. He's reliable, dependable, he's on top of shit. He makes running a fucking app look easy. Mishima is best boy and I will fight you on this. He has no downsides, no faults in a narrative sense, and he's just a great person to get to know. His perks are surpassed by none, because everyone levels up the same now. That's incredible! As far as I know, no other game does this in the series, so grinding takes a long ass time. But here, it's just as simple as talking to this pure fucking boy, and I love him for that. The only thing that sucks about him is that he doesn't get a persona. He goes through the same kind of awakening we do, but doesn't wake into a persona, which as far as I know isn't limited to just our cast of characters, anyone can do it, you just have to realize it. Minus that narrative oversight, I'm so glad I got to know him, and he can always rely on me, no matter what. But you can't laugh at me, even if I fail. Promise? You help me out with my business, smuggling goods, destroying evidence. And as a reward, I'll introduce you to the special menu. With good prices for a punk like you. What do you say? Not bad, huh? He was just... more big dad energy, but without the warmth that comes from Sojiro. The ex-Yakuza member turned adoptive dad and prop salesman is just so... I don't know how to say this, but he's just so damn chill. I love him. He's like that fun uncle that slips you violent video games at Thanksgiving. And guns! You know, the real things in life. His story about learning to trust his son and allowing him to know his backstory and what he does for a living, along with just allowing him in the shop, is heartwarming and one of my favorite in the game. Not to mention that song is a fucking bop. Remember how I said Price is the best song in the game? While I stand by that, I have to add an asterisk in that it's the best palace theme, but Layer Cake, which I love that name by the way, it makes no sense and it's amazing nonetheless, slaps so hard it's one of those themes you listen to on its own or just stay in the shop for a while to be able to hear it all. This game has great tracks, no wonder people love it. Anyway, his perks are… Well, how do I say this? His perks are shit. He's able to let you mod guns, which is cool if you want guns, but until Okumura's palace, there really isn't a reason to seeing as no persona is exclusively weak to gun until then, that being Mothman. So while I love you Iwa, there really isn't a ton of reason to go for you if presented with anyone else at night. Besides one person, but we'll cover her when we get there. Even though you're not the best confidant to go for, you're always willing to help out. And for that I'm grateful. Well, I'll leave that to the youngsters. Counting on you, kid. Okay, then how about this? I'll let you skip class a few times. It's tough not having any place where you belong, isn't it? However, I reserve the right to change my mind if your grades drop. And in exchange, you won't tell anyone that I'm moonlighting as a maid. Sound good? Oh god, Kawakami. 
I fucking hate the implications of this one. First off, she's your teacher coming to your house in a bad wig with a fake white girl name to do favors for you and eventually rub you down to make you feel all better. Not to mention that she's extorting you for money. Yes, the game makes it seem more mutually beneficial, but seriously, look at this objectively and take away the teacher French maid kink for a second. What is going on here? The woman who has his future in her hands is having him request her in order to pay back loans to some asshats who are extorting her over their kid dying. All we did was call a maid service and she just happened to show up. It's told to us at the start of the game when we meet her that if we do anything remotely out of line, she can report us and get us kicked out. Meaning that she is quite literally the final word of authority on whether or not we stay out of prison. I don't give a fuck who you are, that is some fucked up shit. Again, she never directly states this is part of the deal, but it's not like we can forget that or anything, it's how we're introduced to her for God's sake. And don't even get me started on the fact that she's a romance option. Again, the whole power dynamic is creepy. Not to mention that this whole thing was reversed, a female high schooler with a male teacher in a butler's uniform calling her master with a generic name like Walter, none of you would be defending this. I do not understand why this was even greenlit past the first draft. I don't care about her age and I don't care about the circumstances. I don't care. This is gross and wrong and just stop it. For God's sake, this makes even less sense to defend or indulge in given the fact the game's inciting incident is about almost this exact same scenario. The circumstances in which it takes place are different, but the power dynamic and abuse of power are nearly identical. The only tangible benefit to hanging out with her is her max rank perk, that being massages which allow you to do stuff at night after going to the metaverse, which saves you a shit ton of time. So while I do use her perks, it doesn't mean I condone this. So I guess all I can say is thank you for your service, you groomer. Continue to work hard when you're home. I'll be rooting for you. You supply me with info on the Phantom Thieves, and I'll write articles based on what you tell me about them. I can create a lot of positive PR for the Phantom Thieves, so be sure to give me some good scoops. Fucking hell, Oya is by far the most shit confidant in the game. I wish I was joking because, in all honesty, I like her fair enough. Sure, her rewards are garbage if you give them more than a second's thought, but she as a person is quite nice. It's strange how opposite her and Kawakami are in this regard. Yes, she's an alcoholic. Yes, she tries to get you to drink even though you're underage. However, consider this. Out of any non-party member confidants, you help her change the most. Mishima is a self-discovery story, but Oya needs a push in the right direction. And what better motivation is there than her job validating her to have a girl boss moment and publish the story she wants to tell? I honestly can't even tell you what her perks do. I think it's something to do with security limits and palaces, but in actuality, I don't really care. Oya is by no means the best confidant, but by default, she kinda is the worst, and I feel bad for her because of that. Oh well. Lala Chan, pour us another round. On me this time. In a way, we're accomplices, you know? So I won't let you ignore my calls, got it? This is quite a serious situation for a fortune teller like me. I need to get to the bottom of this. You won't have to do anything. Just sit next to me while I tell fortunes. And if another unopposable fate happens to appear, then I'll test your power. Um, okay, be honest here. Who actually likes Chihaya? I don't hate her, but in terms of her personality, I'm just not a fan. She gives me soft girl vibes and that's valid. However, we really just tell her to tell her boss to fuck off, like Oya, but unlike Oya, only Chihaya and the people who bought into the rock salt stone thing are changed in any way. Say what you will about Oya, at least she's trying to change the journalism scene in Japan for the better and is at worst a gossip columnist at the start of all of it. Chihaya is actively hurting the people of Shibuya with her shoddy practice. Again, Chihaya is a nice person and I'm aware she's doing this because she has to, but it doesn't mean I have to like that about her. Her herself I'm fine with as a character, but how we get to know her is a bit sketchy. I suppose that's one of the many lessons of the game, but there it is. Her perks, to me, are some of her biggest saving graces. The money from all-out attacks, confidant point stacking, and rare item fortunes are pretty much her reason for being in my mind. If she wasn't selling fake hope to people for the equivalent of $910, I'd probably put her above Oya, but as it stands, I can't. I'm sorry I'm being so harsh, but you can read my fortune anytime. Or a discount, that is. I'm proud to have a comrade like you. <laughs> I'm glad I was able to tell you that. However, I will instruct you under one condition. You become my playing partner so that I can research new moves. Is that agreeable? Sad playing girl in the house, y'all. 
We're getting to the bottom of the barrel with these last four girls, aren't we? <laughs> well, at least Hifumi is age appropriate, so chalk that one up for sheer dumb luck, I suppose. My biggest problem with Hifumi isn't anything that's super egregious, it's just too simple to overlook. She's boring as all fuck. Her conflict is so removed from anything in the game, and the only connection we have to this place is from Yusuke bringing us here in his confidant ranks. Other than that, you can only gain access to this place from reading about it. I think someone might bring it up and thus allow you to get there randomly, but still not the best locale if you ask my gay ass. What? The incense hurts my head. I mean, yes, in my Makoto video I talked about why she's got some potential as a character, but I really don't see the appeal from a character perspective. Now her perks... Honestly, I'm torn. On the one hand, they're a must-have. The first and last ranks are fantastic and worth dealing with her whole family drama to get them. However, it seems like someone didn't learn from Kingdom Hearts 2 and put a key mechanic of the game that any other RPG has from the get-go and put it behind an optional thing most people might not know all that well. Why do Japan developers keep doing this? What else can I say about Hifumi? Well, you may not be my favorite girl, but I'll play a fair game of Shogi with you any day. Best two out of three. I truly am no match for you. Which is strange, considering I'm your former teacher. But I think you have a lot of potential. More than most people. If you want, I can teach you a few other moves, too. I have the ultimate trump card. So tell me more about the Phantom Thieves. Here is the best confidant in the game. What? Y'all knew it was coming. I told you about it at the start. What makes Shinya the best is that his arc is so simple. He's not trying to scam people or gut you for information or even use you. He just wants someone to talk to and hang out with in exchange for showing off his hobby, which is his only outlet for his frustration at home. You know, like an actual fucking kid. Shinya is like, what, 12? And his school friends abandon him because of his mother's awful parenting and his depression because of said event. I think people see the story event with him and the cheating gamer guy and go, oh, he's a brat, and write him off entirely. Shinya is a kid left behind by society and has no one to help him out of this situation. He's just a little kid and one without a good role model, so while he may feel bad for being a dick, it's not like he can change on his own. There are too many factors at play to do that, plus his own naivete on how the world works. I'm sorry, but if you didn't get this character, you either weren't paying attention to the game or the world around you. His perks are some of the best the game gives you as they are exclusive to guns, which no one else really helps you with in this manner. Yes, Iwa lets you mod guns, but downshot, bigger ammo bags, and even warning shots are all tied to Shinya, not Iwa, as his are about the gun itself, not what you do with it. I have nothing else to say. I love this child. He's valid and deserves not only my time, but yours. Thanks, kid. If you want, I can go one more round with you. I need the practice. Sorry, I don't know how to say this, but that's the type of person I want to become. You've got some real guts, though. With that spirit, you should have no trouble making progress. Very well, then. If you have the will to continue your penal labor, we can grant you greater freedom within this prison. It is a deal between us, the wardens, and you, the inmate. Not like you have the right to turn it down, though. Hard work is what you're meant to do, inmate. Ah, I love these two so fucking much. They're so fun and interesting. Something about their dynamic is so fun to see. They have such distinct personalities that I can always tell who's talking just by their inflections, despite having the same voice actress. I'll touch on this more when we get to Strikers, but Lavenza massively fucked this up, and I hate that about her. Justine, if I had to explain, has this constantly disappointed sister who is blown away you did the bare minimum because she expects so little of you vibe. Very backhanded in her praise. The deadpan and soft-spoken way she looks and speaks adds to her rather distant approach. Caroline is the exact opposite. She's blunt, brash, abrasive, and has no problem literally beating you into doing what she wants. This also explains how they would deal with their duties in the Velvet Room. For example, when it comes to making or strengthening personas, they both take a role in this, but the Compendium and Registration are all Justine, while the Isolation Cell and Training are Caroline. This is reinforced in both their dialogue. While Justine is again the ever-present tired one, Caroline doesn't give a shit and will just berate you because it's too Tuesday. My absolute favorite part about this duality is when you enter the room. Justine walks you in, Caroline fucking kicks you in the door, and it's not playful. It's a swift kick in the ass with a very satisfying sound effect.
Apparently their confidant is just a rehash of Margaret, same with the boss fight, as it's you gathering the desired personas with the right abilities, thus granting more abilities and perks in the Velvet Room. But what makes this confidant different is that it's all about furthering their characters. With Margaret, you kinda get it automatically. She's Velvet Mom, and that's about it. But these two are more like bratty sisters being told to look after the family dog. They understand their roles, but the gaps in their memories are concerning for them, and thus leads them to rely on Akira more to be able to appease Igor, while also looking into themselves. Yeah, this falls apart a bit if you speedrun it in one sitting like I did, but that's the fault of the game not making you do this like every other confidant and spreading it out at least one day apart, not the writing. If you look at the conversations in each rank on their own, they're really well done, but when they're slammed together, that's when the cracks start to show. The perks are only really beneficial in a first go round or even a first new game plus file, seeing as they tie into the room itself and the compendium, so it's rather limited. But hey, any time with my girls is a good time. Fair bit of warning, save the required persona, then delete it after you've spoken to the girls for the confidant, because if you just delete them after you add the skill, you'll have to redo all the making shit again and the DLC persona fuck this process sideways. While I'm not a huge fan of Igor or the sex dungeon he spawns in, I have to say, I always cry tears of joy whenever I get to see my favorite wardens. Trickster, I believe in you. Prove to us that you can reach the truth. We will be waiting for you. You amateur! Stay still! Hey you! You can fight, right? Let's go! Come! You got one of those things too? We will promptly shut them up! Mona is one of those characters people seem to either love or hate because memes. Because he's one of those aforementioned story mandated confidants, people don't often feel like they have a strong connection to him, and his rather brash and self aggrandizing personality seems to irritate the internet despite half you fuckers acting like this as it is. They also don't seem to get that this is an act. He's trying to act like he knows everything and doesn't deal well with being constantly overshone by everyone around him or no longer being needed. Makoto takes his role as a strategist, Futaba is now the metaverse navigator given her unique ties to cognitive science. And in this case, huh? science is spelled PSI, not SCI. Right, that. And Ryuji, Yusuke, and Haru are the heavy hitters. Be it single target, multi targets, or gun damage, he is simply superfluous in one way or another in his mind. The only thing he is good at is wind attacks. And even then, he never gains access to the second most powerful move of his type, like Makoto or Haru do. His persona, Zoro, also ties into this grandiose mask he puts on. His whole thing is acting big to incite a revolution by the people, so when the others start to help themselves without him, he feels left out. Not to mention, Mona is just a child at the end of the day. He was born probably around January of that year and has no memories to explain where he comes from or who he's supposed to be. He's short-tempered, ill-adjusted, and demanding when the game needs him to be, and a reverse furry for jokes, which just Ew. There are moments in the plot when I actually am drawn to him as a character though, and that's kind of the point I'm making. I do see the flaws, but in reality, when you step back and look at his story as a whole, his character snaps into sharp focus. Yes, it is annoying that he is full of himself sometimes, and he's only really useful in Kamishida and Futaba's palace due to the persona layout. Yes, him making you sleep a lot is stupid. That's a narrative problem, not a him problem. But I can't hate him on the whole because he's just your buddy. He's your constant. He's... Well, Mona. He may not be my favorite thief, and certainly isn't my least favorite, we'll get there. However, he's a character I learn more about every time I play this game. One might even say he's, on multiple playthroughs, even more charming. Honestly, you're amazing. There's definitely something special about you. You dodge everything the enemies throw at you like it's your destiny. At first, I just thought you were going to be a useful tool for me. But now, this is where I belong. Well, maybe in regard to this attic place, but this is where I want to be. There is no turning back. The skull of rebellion is your flag henceforth! No, oh, this was well. Right on! What's up, Persona? This effin' rocks! Now that I got this power, it's time for payback! Yo, I'm ready! Blast him away, Captain Kid!
The delinquent track star turned superhero Skull is one of the most endearing characters in the game that the characters in the story will not stop shitting on. He's constantly told he's dumb and not that great besides being able to hit good, but there's just so much more to him. He's stubborn, he's confident, he's silly, he's fun, he wants Ren's dick a good cup of noodles. He's always carbo-loading due to the strain of his track days and the fan of thievery we've been getting up to, and it's just smart character work. My biggest problem with Ryuji comes from not him, but the way the narrative treats him. Like I said, he gets shit on for basically being bad at school, which, yeah, it's Japan and that's important and college and all that, but so is On and hardly anyone besides Makoto talks bad about it to her. So why the double standard? Is it because of her boobs? It's because of her boobs, isn't it? I'll get to that later, right now we're on Skullboy. Ryuji honestly strikes me as a bit of a mess in terms of his persona abilities because they clearly want you to focus on his elemental skills, but his physical stat is the highest and, like I mentioned with Morgana, Yusuke covers the multi-hit moves pretty well, so I'm a little confused on the direction with these two. I suppose they were trying to make everyone viable in a wide range of abilities, but it's still a bit wonky for me. There aren't really any moments I can say bug me with Ryuji as a character, but more so how the game treats him, but again, that's a later problem. Ryuji by no means is a bad person, he just follows his own path and stands up for people, and if that's what you need to do to be considered bad, then by all means I'll break some rules with you my dude. Now let's blast him away! Hey, this ain't like me, but I managed to change cause you were here helping me. I got y'all wrapped up in this shit, but you stayed with me till the bitter end. You didn't abandon me, so thanks man. <laughs> It's funny, huh? This started out as us training for the Phantom Thieves. <laughs> How'd it end up like this? Either way, it's my turn now. If anything comes up, you tell me. I'll help you with whatever you need. We can finally forge a contract. I hear you, Carmen. You're right. No more holding back. You know what? I'm not some cheap girl you can toy with. You scumbag. You stole everything from Shiho. You destroyed her. Now it's your turn. I will rob you of everything. No one's gonna stop me now. Let's go, Carmen. Oh God, where do I begin with On? Panther is a well-written, fun, interesting character that I wish the writers had given half of a thought to besides her design and sexy foreigner appeal despite the ick factor of her age. I won't talk too much about that because it's going to come up later in a different section, but it's just so weird. Like, the way the game has her rely on her sex appeal skis me out so much. I actively wonder why her default animation is her twirling her hair braid. Wait a fucking second! What 16 year old girl has hair braids? And look, I'm not saying women can't be sexual. In fact, I'm here for it in full force. Men do not own women's bodies, nor have the right to tell them what they should do with them. However, she's six fucking teen and being written by horny old Japanese men, and I just cannot view her through any other lens. It's not the same as characters like Bayonetta, who were written and designed by a woman, and thus deal with her sexual nature in a very different way than On. The way she carries herself, acts, and even fights is sexually charged, but that's more a character decision, not a writer's one. Bayonetta is also like an immortal witch who looks and sounds like she's in her late 20s to early 30s, so I'm more inclined to not be weirded out by that. On, on the other hand, is just way too sexual to be 16, and it bugs me because I like her. Sure, she's a little ditzy, which is also a blonde stereotype I hate, but she's sure of herself, fun to hang out with, has an admittedly fun weakness for sweets, and is on par with some of my favorite characters from like DC Comics. Her subplot about modeling doesn't really come in until Strikers, but hey, it's a good way to add flavor to an already spicy character. Get it? Cause like, her old thing's about fire? Eh, cut the part out. The way she and Ryuji act like childhood friends who bicker all the time is really cute too. It adds to both of them that they have a history outside the game's narrative, which allows us, the player, to feel like they've been friends since On moved to Japan. Hell, it kinda makes me ship them in a way, because while they're both colossal idiots, they at least can have a good time sharing that one brain cell between them. And I'm aware I'm talking more about other characters than just her, which is a vast difference from everyone else, but that's because On works best in a group where she can bounce off of others well. By herself, she's fine, but her standout moments are definitely with the thieves. Oh, and this moment of her asking you to berate her is kind of funny. On isn't one of my personal favorite thieves, but she's one I keep coming back to for a number of reasons. What can I say, but 
Let's dance. I realized that personal relationships are something to be treasured. That's why I'm not going to run away anymore. I'll face myself head on. This time, it's my turn to help someone. But I'm still kind of worried. Do you think you could help me? Mm-hmm. You can lean on me too, if you need it. The world is filled with both beauty and vice. It is time you teach people which is which. Very well. A breathtaking sight. Imitations they may be, but together they make a fine spectacle. Though the flowers of evil blossom, be it known, abominations are fated to perish! The children who adored you as father, the prospects of your pupils, how many did you trample upon? How many dreams did you exchange for riches? No matter what it takes, I will bring you to justice! So, yeah, Yusuke is my least favorite of the thieves, and ironically, it's for the exact opposite reasons to On. Yusuke's biggest crime is that he blends into the background of a lot of group chats. Well, yes, he is eccentric and funny with how oblivious he is, the game just has him either restate or affirm what others say. And yeah, that fits him, but it doesn't make him stand out much when compared to the others. His role in the team is basically the icy wall that freezes people up, and while I get that, it doesn't mean I have to like it all the time. The only moments I can say in the story I remember him after his palace are when he fucks up Futaba's statues and when they talk about going on vacation. But that's really it, and I don't know why, but he just fades off my brain. In fact, I struggled to get through his confidant because of this. Not that the story is bad, in fact, I love the plot, but the whole thing is making duplicate skill cards and while that's cool, I never really used it, and in fact I don't think I've ever used it unless it was for high counter or something. Again, I loved his confidant, his oddities were put on full display and I love just how weird he can be, along with the ways in which he just doesn't understand how to human, it's relatable as hell. I guess this is a good time to talk about confidant abilities for teammates. The basic rundown is that you get 5 generic abilities, several character specific ones, and then a second awakening to make the thing worth a damn getting through, which comes with a nifty dodge my weakness ability by default. The generic ones are stuff like baton pass, taking a hit for joker if he's gonna die, slapping the sick out of you, and stealing a second chance from kingdom hearts in the most hilarious way possible. Then there's stuff like ryuji's insta kill, haru's plants, morgana giving you access to all infiltration tools, futaba's cognitive perks, and on getting an ability to seduce shadows or make them not attack you for a turn. You know, things like that. But Yusuke's cards just never came up in my playthrough all that often, which sucks because, like I said, he's got a good story. It's just overshadowed by everyone else's singular ability being more immediately helpful. Yusuke is a character I don't personally gravitate towards, but nonetheless, he's a beautiful display of art and fury. I feel contradictory, but that's the human heart, correct? <sighs> Interesting. That's exactly what I should be painting. It must have been troublesome dealing with me, but for some reason, I knew that you wouldn't abandon me until everything was said and done. Thank you, my friend. Have you decided to tread the path of strength? Yes. Come to me! Very well. Let us proceed with our contract at once. This memorable day marks your graduation from your false self. Feel it. Myself. Me. Got it. I will not lose heart again. Ever. I'll go full speed, non-stop. Right, Johanna? Best girl in the house, y'all. I already have a video on Makoto, so I'm going to be very brief here because this video is already repetitive enough as it is. Makoto is a book smart social disaster that wants to shake the bad reputation she's gotten for being too perfect due to the adults around her holding her up to both her father and sister's reputations because fucking Japan. That's it. She's not all that complex. She just wants to learn how to be a teenage girl, and to do that, needs help understanding what her friends get up to. 
It's strange, we went from the worst design character to the worst written group character to the best character, but I can't find much to say about her that won't come off as a complete rehash. Her design's good, her story is great, her persona is cool, and I can't really add anything to her. She's practically perfect. I will say the first two arcs of the game where she won't shut up with the principal can fuck the hell on off, but after her awakening she's just amazing. What else can I say? Makoto is just the queen, and she charged you Hana right into my heart. Thank you for all your help. Must have been difficult babysitting the uptight Miss President, right? Just kidding. Even so, I'm glad I asked you. I think now I'll be able to see the world even more differently. Actually, I'm sure I can. Because I have you. Hentai girl everyone says has the best character arc because she has a palace themed around it like P4. I get why people like this, and yes, it makes her a strong character, however, in comparison, it makes her character arc feel stretched out, seeing as for everyone else, their character development is relegated to their confidants after their respective associated palaces. Futaba's I've already talked about in the earlier section, but to reiterate, the arc stops you from doing anything for basically two weeks and it's annoying. Her palace, like I said earlier, is quite nice. However, again, the month of September needs to fuck off and die for how much it railroads you. But that's a plot thing, not a character thing. Futaba herself is actually quite fun, and as someone with autism I feel very seen by Futaba, especially this line from Makoto, expressing the very real reality of how Futaba opened up right after Yusuke messed with her figures, and then just went on a rant about the show because she enjoys it. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Her social anxiety, her depression, her self-blame, her frankly deep-seated need to be heard but not wanting to be physically seen is honestly why I started this channel in the first place, and admittedly her cockiness when it comes to her hacking and tech knowledge is one of, if not her best character traits. This is why when I rank the cast, Futaba is in the top 5, because she's there just being her and it works. Other than her frankly bizarre leaning to fetish territory by way of the writers a la Diva, I can't really do anything but sing her praises. She leaves the noobs alone because she's Futaba. No, you're forgetting. You gave me something really important. You gave me my life back. It's thanks to you that I learned I'm fine just as I am, and that I learned to trust my mom again. I was as good as dead, but you resurrected me. I want to use my work with the Phantom Thieves to return you the favor. And when I remember all the friends I've made, it's like I'm tapping into some kind of unknown power. So vulgar. No! Haru's persona won't stand a chance against that! Don't worry! <laughs> she hadn't awakened to her real power! That's all! <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> yes, that gaze! I can finally display my true strength! I am thou, thou art I! Let us adorn your departure into freedom with the view of betrayal! Jeez! Farewell, dear father! I am no longer your subservient puppet! Noir, which is a code name that makes no fucking sense until Royal justifies it later with Kasumi in reverse. Oh, that's right. Sumire in English is violet. But yeah, Noir is French for black, which just feels off to me. I mean, yeah, the others make fuck all sense in context for each other too. Yeah, Joker, Oracle, and Queen fit, along with Panther, Fox, and Crow being animals. Noir just seems off to fit the whole Three Musketeer thing she's got going on, which itself is inherently a French story. Anyway, Haru is an underrated character because of where she comes into the plot. 
Again, September fucks this game sideways. Just drop the school trip or move it to October, it makes way more sense there. Haru is soft-spoken, and that's kinda it. Her character is almost entirely in her confidant, seeing as it deals with the aftermath of her father's death and her now being the majority shareholder of the food company her grandfather started, and it's all interesting. The problem comes in that she shoved into the endgame along with Shinya, so while it's interesting, it kinda feels like you're speedrunning it, as it's basically the only confidant you can do during the day if you've been focusing on confidants the rest of the game. Because she is introduced so late, it's kinda hard to really love or hate her given her lack of screen time. Royal and Strikers fix this, and even dancing to an extent, but we're not there yet. I do like her perks, such as making vegetables that allow you to gain SP in the same or greater capacity to Sojiro's coffee, at the cost of it taking a day or two to happen. Overall, she's fine. Not great, but not awful. Just a bit too late. Haru's a beauty, she's a thief, and I can't wait to see what Milady will do next. I'm so glad I met you. At first, it was nice having someone that understands me. But now, it's much more. There may be times where people resent me for it. But as long as you're here, I'll be okay. Here, I'll show you who I really am. Come! Loki! Again, it's that persona. What's going on? Don't make me laugh. Justice. Righteous. Keep that shit to yourselves. You and your teammates piss me off. He can use two separate powers? Then everything... Even his appearance was a fake! You're going down! I'll destroy you! This kid is a rat bastard. I fucking hate this guy in this game. Why? Because he never shuts up and the game just fawns over him. You are forced to deal with this pissant and hear his demoralizing opinions on your line of work and just smile and take it. Like, motherfucker, I have well over one million dollars on hand in this conversation and I have way more things to do than listen to you wax philosophic on things I know I'm right on. Here's the stupid thing though, I get why he's mandated in this game. Much like how Morgana is a much less annoying walking tutorial version of Teddy, Akechi teaches you about teammate confidants and their application in battle. Akechi is your party member at the start of Sai's palace, and when you enter with him he automatically gets to rank 7, unlocking all party member generic abilities. This teaches you what each party member can do in case you've been an antisocial dickwad the whole game. So kudos on that, but I still hate him. Like the game tries to make you feel like you have a real rivalry with him and make you care about that aspect of them, but because you have no agency in these conversations other than saying dialogue options that don't affect the outcomes at all because they're predetermined, you're just left to listen to him prattle on for like 10 minutes at a time. And the ranks don't even make sense half the time. Yeah, I'll give you ranks 1 through 7. Those make some kind of sense given the narrative, but ranks 8, 9, and 10 don't because he kills you for 8, tries to kill you for 9, and in 10, immediately after 9, the only thing separating the two is a boss fight, he basically asks you to kill his father. These aren't bonding moments, he's trying to kill you, and it's frustrating that we have to act like these matter in any way to the bond we share. I'm honestly surprised this hasn't become a meme at this point. Akechi in the base game is an annoying roadblock that tries to sell you on the yin-yang dynamic, and it doesn't work. He is honestly the worst part of the game for me, which sucks because all other confidants are worth it for me in one way or another, even a tiny way, but not him. Then the TV show happened. Okay, so we need to talk about something real quick before we get started here. This is not a bad anime. I've seen plenty worse than this. However, it's not without sin. The problem with the P5 anime isn't that it's bad, because it's not. I found it a fun time to go through and catalog when and where things will happen compared to the game. Sure, the lip sync isn't 100% accurate all the time, but at least I can tell what character is talking half the time, and the voice acting matches about as well as I'd expect. Not to mention the fact that Xander Mobus is clearly having a ball being able to react more than just saying persona names. No, what this game's problem is, is the same thing that plagues things like Fantastic Four and Attack of the Twonkies, and even 
even more recent examples like Coraline, like a Ninjago, and things of that nature. It's that it's a tie-in. However, where the examples above had to take a 90 to 120 minute movie and had to stretch it into an 8 to 10 hour experience, this has to take an 80 hour experience and shrink wrap it down to a roughly 13 hour coherent one with every relevant character, plot point, and twist that comes with it. And on that front, I think this show nails it. Most of all, adapting the twist into a format that functions. Speaking of that, Akechi, the rat-faced bastard, is actually really well done here. He's added to a few subplots like Yusuke's and has a more substantial presence in the show that is lacking in the middle of the game's narrative. He and Ren play chess a lot because Lazy Shorthand got a lazy, which leads to him seeing Hifumi in the church when Yusuke has you pose there, and thus he strikes a deal with her to learn how to play, which benefits the matches with Akechi. This is honestly a better use of both characters in the narrative because while yes, Hifumi teaches you strategic skills, a nice benefit would have been to have these little chess dates with Akechi separate from your confidant that gave you things like guts and proficiency, and higher your rank with Hifumi, the bigger the rank. Almost like how the game treats owning a persona of the same arcana as the person you're hanging out with. Either way, the implementation of Akechi here is interesting and comes back into Royal later, but obviously I'll discuss that there. However, what I can say is that if you liked the game, you'll probably like this too. Something that never gets brought up that I found super engaging was that it takes the turn-based fights and makes them more dynamic. Like, yeah, most of the time they just stand there, but the way it's animated and the flashy nature of the scene it carries it. And not every summoning of a persona is flashy. Sometimes they just appear, and that works too. Boss fights get a big upgrade because it's no longer just a fight, it actually has to be a scene. And to that end, I think they pull it off well. Like, what's more engaging? Hitting a boss with a standard attack and it being a canned animation? Or an all-out baton pass showdown where everyone gets a moment to shine? Using the same OP personas in Shido's fight? Or seeing Alice just body this old man because she can? Seeing Haru use her axe like normal? or getting a cool animation of it with her doing a leaping dive to perform a plunging attack. For me, the show just has more visually going on that is always different versus how the game can get repetitive after a while because it takes so long to do sometimes. Not saying the game is bad, far from it, I'm just saying that it has its benefits by virtue of the media change, because this cast is giving it their all. One of my favorite moments is when they bring up the maid thing for the first time and Ren's reaction is just priceless. There's a lot of little moments like this, where the actors give a lot more to the performance than they could in the game. It also cuts a lot, and I do mean a lot, of the fat off the game's narrative. Yeah, we see them go through the palaces in a montage, but that's because literally everything else is either more important or interesting to get through. Remember, there are 21 arcana in the story, only 8 of them are your party members, meaning there are 13 people to cram in there in an organic way, along with your friend's petty problems. Everyone's handled more or less as well as they could be here. Everyone gets their moments leave an impression on the audience and the stakes are well kept. When I said the fat was trimmed, I was talking about the palace stuff. Essentially, each palace goes from being a 3 hour trek to the end, to a 1-3 to three episode arc showing off the new character in question, introducing the new baddie of the week, and then killing them before at least one episode of shenanigans later. It even has a lot of the puzzles mentioned and or done on screen, so it feels like the game as best it can in its short run time. There's not a whole lot to add to the show that I already haven't explained before, or won't be covered in Royal. Ironically, we're this shines is where Royal exceeded in, time management. As I already said, the show cuts so much of the waiting around or time spent on small things that don't matter in the grand scheme, but it still shows them off. However, that is also to its detriment in some regard. Given the rush nature of things, it can almost feel like whiplash at times. Granted, this is mostly in the dungeon crawling sections, seeing as the show will often tell you how the game improves mostly through each confidant's abilities. But if you don't play the game, you won't know who half these fucking people are, because the introductions are so short for people like Yoshida that if you happen to not pay attention for half a second, you'll miss him in three episodes later when he comes back and be like, Wait, who the fuck is that? I'm not saying this anime is perfect, I'm not saying it's trash either. The biggest flaw is that it's caught in the middle ground of its own media and the nature of its creation. It wasn't made because someone wanted to make a good show, it was made because Persona 4 Golden was a big hit and it got an anime that was well received, so we have to do one for the best selling Persona game to date and be damned to the budget required to do it. Which sucks because Akechi is so good in this. Akechi has a much more fun personality. He spends time with Joker more. He's set up more to the point that I know what's going to happen, but I was almost half sure they were going to do something else with him. This is one reason the villain of the week vibe Persona has works in its favor. The day-to-day -day shit 
shit sticks with you for one reason or another. I think the plot of P5 is amazing. I like almost every palace leader and everything flows naturally. My biggest problem is Shido, and that's just how he's set up so early that you forget about him 60 hours later, but in the show, he's constantly in the background, more directly indirective in what he's doing. Which is why when you see Akechi betray you, it means all the more, because the true twist villain has been there more and more as time goes by, and Akechi's backstory is actually told to us in a way that makes me give a fuck. I'll level with you right quick. I mentioned earlier that I played the base game four times in a row basically, and each playthrough I learned more and more, other than the big reveal, if that. I can't remember Akechi's motives other than to kill Shido, but the show and Royal expand his story so much earlier that when you learn who his father is, it hits all the more. This scene in general is amazing, I love how Loki and Arsene just crash into each other. It really is the only time we see these two entities on screen at the same time, given that Arsene is functionally garbage unless you expressly build up his stats to be on par with something like Izanagi o Picaro. Sorry buddy, maybe next game when you're DLC they'll make you worth a damn. Anyway, this one shot is so cool and actually shows the dichotomy of these two characters in a way the narrative doesn't capitalize on in the best way. There are a ton of explaining what Arsene is videos and even ones for Loki, but to sum it up, Arsene is a gentleman thief that acted like a Victorian era Robin Hood of sorts, whereas Loki is a catastrophic force that only looks out for himself. This also leads to why Robin Hood itself being the facade persona Akechi uses makes way more sense than it seems initially. One must seem to be a hero and much more big and memorable than Arsene, who is much more thin and lanky. Not to shit on Arsene's design, I actually really like it. Something about his thigh-high, way-out-there frayed boots is hilariously awesome to me. Where the two fundamentally differ is in how they go about their thievery and what their motives are. Ren, while starting off with selfish motives and not wanting to get thrown in prison, kept doing thievery for the benefit of the masses, whereas Akechi was going about it to get in Shido's good graces, and that makes all the difference. Again, all of this is conveyed in one single image. It's just a shame neither game focuses on this because of the nature of Shido's palace. Which, can I ask a stupid fucking question? Why didn't Akechi just wait for us to weaken Shido and then kill him? I mean, I get it, he needed Shido alive so he could reveal himself as his son, but the game and show show us the way that mental shutdowns work is that they take a few days to take effect, two weeks at most, so if we got the treasure to appear, then he shot him, dipped as the city hall pulled a titanic, and then explained later, I don't think much, if anything, of the plot would change besides maybe the reason why why we have to destroy Mementos. That sounds big, but minor changes like his running mate would now take his position as acting president isn't a huge stretch of a reason because that's how politics works in general. It's weird, I'm making a case this show is great, but then stumbles, counterintuitively being worse because it added so much to one character who needed a huge makeover, but then not following up on it in any way that makes sense. Again, this is due to the nature of company mandated adaptation, but still. It would have really brought the whole killing someone in the metaverse thing from Akumura back around in a nice way, or perhaps that was to explain the shutdowns, but either way, it's okay. Not great, but still works. And really, that can be said for the rest of the show as well. But I have to ask you, what would happen if you adapted this story for a third time, but were allowed to change things? Well, my dear teddy bears, that's where things get... interesting. Persona 5 Royal is a strange creature to me. It almost feels like a director's cut of a game, almost akin to the Kingdom Hearts Final Mix situation, but way longer. Where Kingdom Hearts adds small things and fixes some tiny quality of life aspects, like rebalancing mechanics or a specific magic along with say maybe an ability or two added, sometimes even an entire difficulty mode. Overall, while these changes are nice and or necessary to the game on the whole, they aren't that big. The biggest thing added are often secret bosses or things like the Cabin of Remembrance or the KH3 Remind DLC. The difference with this and things like Remind is that Royal is a re-release jam-packed with quality life changes along with new characters that impact the plot and an entirely new ending of the game that is dedicated to those new characters, which I will get to in a moment. However, let's get the small things out of the way first. First off, combat has a very big overhaul to it. Not that it's suddenly real-time action, though that would have been amazing. No, what they changed was just enough to make the combat feel more varied than before. First off, baton passes are now a default ability that anyone can do as soon as they are playable, which fixes the entire entire Okumura arc in one fell swoop. Second is that guns not only refill ammo between each fight, but now replenish said ammo after every fight. It basically makes gun modding a much more viable thing since you're able to deal damage consistently rather than just at the start of the palace. It also gives guns 
becomes more viable use given that you can switch between the characters for the baton pass, which makes it way easier to kill everyone but the shadow you want to negotiate with. It also makes Haru's rocket launcher way more useful as a final smash of sorts given its massive damage and that it hits all opponents in one shot. Not to mention that each subsequent baton pass has a color differential that tells you how powerful it is, so now you always know which level you're on. In the base game, you could get all four party members to do a baton pass, but knowing which level you were at was sort of in the air if you weren't fully paying attention. Now, that has been reworked into something more flashy, more vibrant, and overall, more fun to use. Confidant abilities were also reworked. As far as I can tell, they moved around some things per rank and even changed some entirely. For example, Chihaya is almost entirely the same, but as the fusion alarm ability, which sets off the fusion alarm automatically so that you can get rare items from the fusions produced from the alarm. The alarm system itself is really interesting to me given that it makes you choose when and where you want to make a certain persona or itemize them because an alarm makes them more powerful than if you were to do it normally. For example, if you wanted to sacrifice Satanile to get Joker's best knife, you can at no risk. However, if you want to press your luck, you can do it during an alarm for the same item, but with better stats and a slightly different paint job. Speaking of that, I mentioned that gun customization is a lot better in this game, and I mean that. First off, the rank 5 ability is having everything be half price, and the rank 10 is getting them for free so that kicks ass. However, the perks given in between those two ranks are great as well, because they pertain to the level of guns you can craft and how well you can craft them. Basically, you can take the best guns and melee weapons in the game and make them even better, making you a nigh unkillable god for most of the game. Yes, even on Merciless. Hell, especially on Merciless. Most other confidants have minor changes. The twins are basically the same, just changing the order of things with a few of the new personas added to spice things up. If I'm being honest, returning confidants are not what I'm here for, but they needed to be brought up because they tied into the combat so much, omitting them would have just been stupid. Palaces are more or less the same with a few scenes added to strengthen characters, and some rooms have been slightly altered, but more or less, they're the same way they were in the base game. The biggest shift is that they add in things like will seeds. Will seeds are both super cool to me, but also feel kinda out of left field because they tie into the accessories which in this game kick all the ass. In the base game you had accessories that had passive abilities like SP and HP regen along with resistances and even stat boosts to things like evasion, and that was it. It sounds like a lot, but when you realize that most encounters on normal or even hard don't need you to dodge things all that much, you'll probably stick to the regen abilities and that's about it, like I did. Now they have active skills that can be gained from persona itemization. The only time these are super helpful is in the Okumura fight and maybe Maruki's palace, given that half the things in there are only weak to like Curse and Bliss, which only Akechi and Kasumi are proficient in, and the Lavenza boss fight, which fuck that thing. So for the Okumura fight, the team I ran is on Makoto for the heals, and Ryuji, with Mystic ring on the ladder too because fuck these executives. Seriously, this fight is designed to make you use this mechanic. Without these rings, I would not have won the fight, because it's designed to test your planning and use of the baton pass system. The smartest thing is just to use the single attack moves that Joker, Ryuji, and Makoto all have, to then have the last person in the pass cycle be Haru so that she can use her multi-hit side moves on all of them while racking up the damage on the guy whose defense is boosted while also having the executive self-destruct order placed on him. This fight also would be smoother with Hifumi's rank 10 ability, but if you at least have have her started, the fight can be easier since you can switch from On and Morgana to the dream team of backup. Or I guess you could just use them the whole fight now that I think about it. Yeah, do that. I'm dumb, I just made this one step harder than I had to. So do what I said above, just give the mystic ring to the two cats and you should be fine. The rulers in general are all pretty identical to how they were in the base game. For the most part, the only real difference is that ones like Madarame and Kaneshiro only have two phases rather than switching between the two modes of attack. Kamashita now summons in Mishima and Jiho to do his big spike attack, Sai's roulette gimmick now applies to her affinity and is a mainstay of the fight, so you can't just bring in the same team every time unless you just spam items. I already covered Okumura in detail, so the only big thing to add is that there's now this Mecha Haru that only delays the fight like two turns, and that's about it. Wakaba is the same, only now Futaba needs a pep talk to help and if you get it wrong, she doesn't. Which I thought was a neat addition and it actually tripped me up once. And Shido just gets another phase where you have to deal with him one on one, so that's fun. These simple changes really add to making the fights more engaging. For example, Madarame summons in clones that are weak to each party member's strengths, making Baton Pass a godsend in this fight. And Kaneshiro has guards that block him from getting attacked until he runs out of money to pay them. Stuff like that just makes things more engaging than if you just had to redo the old fights. The only ones that seem the most similar are the very first and the very last, because they're meant to be the tutorial and finale of the base story respectively, so changing too much would have been a bit overkill. Outside of palaces, there are some 
nice new things added like hangouts with friends to help flesh them out. I feel like the devs got the notes that the group only hangs out to discuss plot stuff and not actively spend time with one another, so to remedy this they added more plot stuff but had dumb bro time energy added before and after it. This adds to the biggest thing in Royal, the Thieves' Den. The Thieves' Den is essentially the Insomniac Museum from Ratchet & Clank, only devoted to P5. The entire room was full of things to collect, in-game trophies to get, songs, concept art, and even splash screens. Hell, there's even a cute card game to play if you want to get free currency. Oh, right, doing said in-game trophies nets you currency that lets you buy things to put in the den, all of which people can come and look at them and even make comments about them, with the locations they'll even sit in them and just hang out. LeBlanc is probably the one most people see this happen with. You can also get concept art along with the all-out attack screens, which really helped my ass out because finding these things without enemy blood in the background was damn near impossible or in a good enough quality. And with that, I think that's every superfluous thing I can think about in Royal except... Ah, there he is, right on time. This is Jose. Not Jose, it's Joe, but French sounding. And this is my precious boy who needs to be protected at all costs. He is the Sora of this game, and if anyone hurts him, besides me, I will personally mentally your shutdown. Jose is a little... Well, I'm not too sure what he is. I'm going to assume he's a robot like Igus, or is a descendant slash relative of the Velvet attendants that wound up wanting to learn about humans like his older sisters did. But because he's like his older brother Theodore, he isn't exactly rolling a 20 for perception. Man, I really want Theo to be a proper attendant in the next game. Hashtag justice for Theo. I love Jose. He's so polite and just a wonderful, cheerful white dot on the blood red that is this game's canvas. All he wants is flowers and stamps. Scattered around mementos randomly are these flowers that Jose finds delicious, and in exchange for letting him drink the nectar, he'll sell you items. And they're often really good, and if they aren't, you can always sell them later for real money. And since the buds disappear when you leave mementos, there's literally no reason not to buy things from him when he's there. The other half of Jose's addiction is his stamp collection. <laughs> Basically, these little star-shaped ink blots are this game's equivalent of alpha Pokemon. They're rare enough to be worth finding, but they're random enough that you still have to hunt for them. By collecting a certain amount, you can affect the cognition of mementos to have it yield different results, be it an XP bonus, an item bonus, or a money bonus, and you can pick which one you want him to dump points into and you can always rework it later if you feel like you need more of one than the other. I personally always went for XP since the ways in which you get money in this game are so numerous I was almost always well over 1 million and reached 10 in no time, and items were only really helpful when I was looking to craft weapons, which, again, was a lot less important till I hit Haru. Jose is just a sweet little bean with an adorable clown car who just wants to understand people. He's by far my favorite new character in Royal, and probably my favorite side character in the P5 series. Sophia is a close second, but she slides into the main character slot, so again, no contest. Moving on to the actual stars of the game, Akechi, Kasumi, and Maruki. And I say that because these three are the only truly new things in Royal. Let's start with our edgy boys since he has the least to add to this topic, given that he was only added two. Akechi went from being the single worst aspect of base 5 to one of the more fun and interesting confidants in Royal. First of all, he's optional. Secondly, he's optional. Thirdly, he's fucking optional! I cannot stress this enough, but Akechi being a non-mandatory event that just lets you experience him is one of the single smartest things the game could have done. No more are you forced to listen to him rant to your fucking face about how terrible you are and instead are able to learn about him organically at your own pace. And the game even makes it so that most of his confidant is locked until mid-game so that you get this steady drip feed of content with him and his events are really nice. From playing pool to going to the jazz club to taking a hot bath with him, it's nice and much more engaging than the prior game. There's this scripted fight you do the night before Sai's palace now that you can either win or lose and you gain his respect for going all out on it. It's great! Someone that I hated in the base game through the process of adaptation and reinterpretation has become one of my more liked characters. It removed one of the dumbest aspects of Akechi in base 5, and that when he shoots you dead, you go, huh, you know what, I understand him more now, and rank up because plot. No, here you spar off in a gentleman's duel, and that makes you understand him. Sure, ranks 9 and 10 are the same, but now given the context we've built up with him, learning about his family situation beforehand, it seems less contrived, less forced, less annoying than before. And that understanding leads us, ironically, into Maruki. 
Takato Maroki is this game's make or break character. If you do his confidant, you get the third semester, and if you don't, you can't get it as your interactions are what spark the idea he has to rewrite the world. His confidant is surprisingly deep. He not only gets to talk to you, but helps to deal with the loss of his girlfriend's memories and the life he led before coming to Shibuya. Your actions directly affect this man's life and garner his sympathy for our plight as the player along with the outcome of our actions in this game. Maruki even gets to talk to the other thieves about their lives and all the wants they have and wish to be fulfilled. Makoto wants a better relationship with her sister and her father back. Ryuji wishes Kamashita hadn't injured him and he could be a track star again. Yusuke wants his mother's artwork to be given the credit it deserves. On wants Shiho to be back and not depressed, and Morgana wants to be human. Simple things that do break reality but aren't harming anyone, which leads them to consider keeping those wishes permanent. But they know it's wrong, so affirm their true desire to take Maruki down and make the world a better place the hard way by actually working towards it with their own two hands. What makes this so fantastic is that it weaves in the idea of choice in the dirty underbelly of society that the base game was so great at telling the fuck the hell on off, and combines it with a character that is, in all honesty, just doing what he thought was right. He didn't want to rule the world for selfish reasons, he didn't want to take people's money or molest children. No, he just wanted to do his job and follow his passion. The only difference is that his trauma caused him to do it in a mental manipulation way. This ties in the strikers a lot too, so don't forget Maruki, he will come up there too. However, before before we delve into his palace, we need to bring up the smoking gun in the room, Kasumi Yoshizawa. Kasumi is a character that's hard to talk about because she's literally two different characters. The first five ranks of Kasumi's arc are her trying to be a better person at basic things, mostly just being a perfectionist about everything. But the things she's trying are being a good gift giver, training joker, self-confidence, things of that nature. Not saying they're bad, but they're very surface, and that's the point. See, we learn in the third semester that Kasumi, or rather who we thought was Kasumi, was actually... Her twin sister, Sumere! <laughs> oh god, why is that so dumb? Look, I get it, it's emotional, and yes, this twist absolutely makes sense. I'm not mad about it at all, but the whole, oh, this character is actually their twin is so cliche, I almost commend the game for doing it in a way. The only way this could have been better is if she was actually the evil twin, but I'm getting ahead of myself. The reason this ties into Maruki in his palace is that this is as much Sumeri's arc as it is his. Remember how I said that every party member has an arc associated with the palace they were introduced in? Makoto shook off her Little Miss Perfect act, Ryuji and On took back their lives the man who's been torturing them for years, Akechi learned to respect his enemies and that he was the asshole all along. Yeah, I know it's not fair he gets two, but at least one of them was shared with Joker, so that's nice. Haru learned to stop being so quiet and reserved, and Yusuke stood up for his right to be a person and have his and others work be given their just dues. Well, here, Sumeri has to learn that she deserves to be her own person, separate from the legacy of Kasumi, which, ironically, I'm 50% of the way done with the script for. Sumeri was Maruki's first real client with his latent persona abilities. Azathoth essentially has the power to warp people's cognition in whatever way Maruki wants, so long as they are susceptible or receptive to it. And he took Sumeri's grief and denial and manifested it into a need to become the one person she feels she owes her life to. I'm dancing around this and I don't know why. I'm just not sure how to breach it. Everything else in the game is treated with some weight, but is brushed off for the most part, including, but not limited to, the death of Haru's father on national television, on seeing her friend try to commit not alive by way of taking Luka too seriously, Ryuji getting his kneecaps quite literally stolen, and Futaba watching her mother get hit by a car because brain aneurysm. And while, well, yes, Ryuji's thing isn't shown on screen and Futaba's is in still images, that doesn't mean they aren't recent, pivotal thing in these characters' lives that we just kinda forget about after a hot minute because we got bigger things to deal with and moving past trauma is kind of the point of the story. But when it comes to this, not only do we get one of those beautiful 2D animated scenes, we also have to watch it in real time from Sumeri's perspective. That's the big difference between the rest of these moments. We are forced to see things as she does, and it gives way more context and emotional depth to the fact that she invariably caused the death of her sister. Her grief and longing and frank jealousy and resentment of how popular and better at everything she was, coupled with her inferiority complex drove her to want to be her sister, and Azathoth made her believe that she was, going as far to warp her brain to perceive her own name as her sister's, and fixing her fucking eyes like psychic Lasix or something. It's fucking awesome, and I mean that. It's such a cool twist and such a big development in both characters in one move. And here's how. 
Firstly, it colors Maruki's worldview and his philosophy given that she was his first real patient that he tried to influence. Seeing the resounding success, he wanted to expand and change the world to be free of strife, giving him the only altruistic palace in the game. Hell, the entire P5 series. All this man wanted was to help people, and did so by starting with a grieving girl who wanted nothing more than to live up to her sister's memory. This, in turn, colors Sumeri after she wakes up from her coma. Oh my fucking god, stop writing in comas to justify gaps of time you want the player to not think about how your story is written. Comas aren't good for you guys. Jesus fucking Christ. Just stop. Ah. Anyway, after you spend the next week talking to your friends, Sumeri fights you and of course we win. After we re-enter the palace, she has her second awakening, giving us access to her final five ranks, and thus allowing us to finally meet the real Sumeri. Sumeri's final five ranks are her being a disaster of a person, and it's just wholesome. Also, before we move on, yes, I see the frumpy girl in glasses trope being used, and I hate it. I get it, shy people use their hair to hide themselves a lot, but you could have done more with it. Then again, I suppose her having the most normal hair in the game tracks for her as a person, and her whole theme. The point of the Kasumi half of her ranks was to show that she wasn't good at pretending to be someone else, no matter how hard she tried. Her second half is all about her discovering herself again. From gymnastics to clothes to gifts to any number of topics she can try, she became a real person again. I think Samiri has the best arc of any party member because the game stakes not only its climax on it, but spends so much time fleshing it out, and knowing most players will want to experience it rather than making it feel less substantial like how most people felt the rest of the team came off. Alright, that's the characters dealt with, but how does the palace feel? Maruki's palace is the best in the game, hands down. It's fresh, it's new, it's challenging, the puzzles are super fun, the enemies are all interesting in their designs, and even the palace guards being other researchers is just a cool idea. In past palaces, it's almost exclusively been guards of different types. The most unique type outside of the generic guard and knights were the museum curator ladies and Matarames, because they acted as spotlights for other guards to appear, which was a really cool concept. Back to Maruki, I love the weird wonky ways this place feels, the wires and giant cameras everywhere shows the real ways in which he views freedom or happiness, micromanaging of people and their emotions, which in one single piece of architecture says volumes more than Kamashita, lining his palace with busty teenagers because we get it, he's a pedo. This is how you build on a concept. Guys who also wrote the first act of the game? Funny that. This place also has just good pacing when it comes to how the gang infiltrates it. There's the initial confrontation, rescuing Sumire, the first attack wave, the day of mementos, the final attack wave, and then the final boss. It's nice because the rest of the game has so little to do in the palaces after your initial visit, because aside from the first two, they don't really stop you from progressing after the plot gets rolling. This is so that you could organically choose what to do with your time, and if you wanted to beeline it to the end and deal with life stuff. Here, it doesn't really have that freedom because the devs can assume you've done most or everything before being yelled about, allowing allowing them to make it so that you pretty much have every day planned out, and most nights can be devoted to buffs or trophies. I also like this little detail that before you shatter Maruki's hold on your friends, the world has this obnoxious bloom effect on, which just puts you on edge in a subtle way. The mementos of Maruki's world shares his stark white and overly wired palace, adding to the tacked on feeling of how he kinda piggybacked off the final boss to hijack the whole of Japan. The final boss of the third semester is killer. I love it. From the moment you enter the palace and start ascending the stairs, and the game starts playing the absolute banger, I believe, which talks about the very concepts the thieves, and in fact the whole game, stands for. In the fight, depending on which party members you have, Maruki will talk to them and ask them about their ideals throughout the battle, and it leads to much more in-depth and thoughtful conversation than, hey, you're worthless. No, we're not. I guess you weren't worthless after all. Now, Pause. I need to make this extremely clear. The fights and bosses and villains of Persona 5 are great and fun and are meant to be cartoonishly evil, and I praised them earlier for this reason. The fact that we are in their heads dealing with their distorted desires is going to make them less realistic and less impactful as a character because they, like any good villain should be, are vehicles for the plot that drive our characters to be better than they were when we met them. Maruki is the rare instance when a villain being given more depth works because he was built up in the story as a friend and a mentor figure that allows us to care about him when he falls from grace. I need to make this as crystal clear as I can. Because this is a game with a 120 hour playtime, if you're rushing, that gives time for this shit to breathe, whereas with a show, and especially a single movie, they tend to try to go for this but end up making a starlight glimmer, or Varian, or fucking Hawk Moth, when in reality they should be going for characters like Anakin or Cedric. Characters who have a clear art to work with and are people who we can actually care for, not just some whiny fuck who ruined his life over absolutely nothing, you absolute prick. 
Maruki is the gold standard for a fallen hero and a friend turned enemy, and we need more of this shit in gaming. Persona 5 Royal is an amazing time, and well worth the price. Yes, you are getting the same game again for 75% of the runtime, but the other 25% they added and changed and tweaked to an already amazing foundation cannot be overstated in quality. If you haven't played it yet, I highly recommend it. I will say though, if you haven't beaten Vanilla P5 yet, I would say do that or at least play it first so that you understand the differences on a fundamental level and aren't just getting the best of both worlds, you ungrateful peasants. Whew, that was fun. I'm tired of being serious though. Who wants to go dancing? You know, playing this game, I learned something about myself. I actually like rhythm games after about 10 hours in. I've never delved into the other games in the series, so I can't imagine how this stacks up, nor do I care. I'm more looking into how the plot of the game functions and how the music is reflected in the game, along with how the characters are treated. First, I want to take on a criticism I've seen lobbied at the game, that being the dancing doesn't really match the music outside of A and V's or specific tracks that have the whole gang together, or a DLC like Lavenza and Akechi's tracks. I understand what they're going for, but from what I could tell from me platinuming the game, the moves match up pretty well. Well, yes, a lot of the moves and angles are recycled, that's mainly because you won't be paying attention to the dancing since, you know, playing a rhythm game. Each character has their own style of dance. Haru is ballet, Yusuke is performative, On is sensual, Makoto is this weird fighting type, almost robotic sort of style, Ryuji is kanji minus the thong, wait a second. Ren is pretty hip hop inspired because he's basically anime Jesus. Futaba is just awkward. Morgana is a drunk guy at a party and I have no idea what the hell Justin and Caroline are doing, but it's freaking adorable. I love these two so much more than Lavenza. I'll cover her more in Strikers, but suffice to say that I like the fact this game unfused them just so we could have our lovely girls back. Each dance fits the character more than it fits the song itself, which I know sounds wrong in a rhythm game, but I think it makes some semblance of sense given that we're more focused on the button prompts and not what's going on behind them. However, that doesn't excuse... <sighs> this. Why do we continue to let Japanese men make media involving teenage girls? Like, the boys get this as their team video, but the girls get the cell block tango by way of Moulin Rouge? Just... Why? I've been holding off on this the whole video, but I think we need to address this. On is way, way, way too over-sexualized in this series. I know her whole thing is about taking back her sexuality and taking control over her life, but Jesus tap dancing Christ, this is just too much. The games linger on her a bit too long. The inciting incident that gets us into the second palace is a guy wanting to paint her nude. Damn near every outfit she has shows her off like a doll, and in any instance she is shown showing her skin in any way, it's always glistening. Oh, and let's not forget to mention that her default thief outfit has her in a red latex bodysuit with her tits half out, brandishing a bullwhip. <sighs> Am I the only one that sees a problem with this? Like, imagine a 16-year-old boy dressed, posed, and animated in a similar way. Would you not cry foul on that? I can't even say that Royal or Strikers does this any better, because in Royal, she gets an ability that basically makes every male-coded demon thirst for her in the middle of a fight harder than the cat does, and in Strikers, the first jail again revolves around someone liking her for her body, and that being, in some way, involved in what turned them into being a bastard. I get that these characters have to stick to their cards a lot, but she's 16, guys! I mean, good god! Why is it okay to perv on a 16-year-old at all? I know she's fictional, and so are the rest of the girls, but Makoto and Haru are basically left alone and it's only on and Futaba who gets sexualized this bad. Futaba has a lot of similar things happen to her, but her fucking summer outfit is this. And her winter outfit, her winter outfit, is a tank top, thigh high socks, knee high boots, and a way too big jacket. Her summer outfit fares better in the winter because her fucking legs are covered. The boys are dressed like they're going to the Arctic, but the girls might as well be wearing cocktail napkins. Oh, wait a second, Futaba has that exact same concept as an outfit in this game. I know, the video has all four of them the same outfit doing the dance, but On is the worst in this series for no other reason than because the men drawing her thought it would be cool to have a hot chick as part of the main team. Alright, now that we have that rant out of my system, let's look at the rest of the game. The social links are all various extensions of what the base game had already done with these characters, only now it's about dance. Pretty much, the girls are trying to find confidence in their skills, while the boys are trying to find their style. Morgana is being thirsty, and the twins are trying to understand their guests better. Essentially following in Margaret's footsteps in 4, along with the example set by Elizabeth in 3. 
God, I hope that's right. I know next to nothing about these two except that the twins and by extension Lavenza have an inferiority complex to them given that they were fucked out of doing their job because some jackass pulled a Heather McNamara. If I took a meat cleaver down the center of your skull, I'd have matching halves. That's very important and gave them selective amnesia. The social links are pretty self-contained. They are needed to get to the end credits given that the twins unlock the final songs and the credits themselves, and how you get that is by viewing social links. I do like how the other thieves are in these scenes, so there are more people to bounce off of besides Joker. It's also kinda just nice that these are all voiced. I have difficulty reading a lot of the time, so dialogue helps me understand text a lot better than if it was by itself. Man, I really wish Audible would sponsor me. That'd be one hell of a segue right now. But anyway, it's really good to have the cast being able to flex on some of the flimsiest motivations I've ever seen to justify a plot. Again, it's a rhythm game, I'm not asking for the moon here. So while I'm poking fun, I'm well aware of the material we're working with. The dance tracks on the other hand? Bruh. Bruh! The dancing in this game is so good. Like I said before, the styles of each character is kept intact, and it makes sense for who it's meant to be representing. Along with that, the tracks that are here are super great. Price, Wake Up, Get Up, Get Out There, Rivers in the Desert, Yelled About, all of them are great. Although that last one can drag a bit since it's like 800 notes or something. The remixes are fun though. I legit listen to Winds of Fate, Willpower, and When Mother Was There constantly. I still think having more of the palace themes would have been nice because while we have a lot of them, not having all of them seems kinda weird. Kinda like having none of the pirate tracks or Deep Jungle in Melody of Memory. Like, I get it, but it's not a super great feeling, you know? Fever Time is an interesting mechanic I didn't really know was a thing until I played this, and it's one of those things that adds to the fun of it all. Basically, you can have up to two characters join you for a dance, and each of them has their own unique combo and dialogue options that make them feel special. You even get some with Caroline and Justine, which is just pure. The DLC tracks absolutely slap. Akechi even gets the original willpower, and his lines are as crazy as ever. This was before Royal, so give the kid a break. He hadn't fully snapped yet. I've even dabbled into the P3 and 4 tracks, as well as the ones for the other Velvet attendants, and they're fun. I'm not a huge fan of Theodore's because it's slower, same thing with Lavenza's. I'm much better at faster tracks because my reaction time is way better than my patience, and these songs just drag. It is nice that some tracks have unique difficulty-based easter eggs, like in Lavenza's number, she turns back back into the girls for the bridge of the song, but that's only on all night mode. I will say that her interactions with her sisters is nice. You can really feel the inferiority complex in her animations and voice lines. It's just a good time. Overall, Dancing in Starlight is a fun time killer if you want to zone out with some of the game's best tracks and see all there is in this funny little package. It's well worth the time to pick up if you like the characters and just want some more P5 in your life. It sure caught me off guard. Is it as complicated or deep as the base game? No, but it's more time with our thieves, which is kind of the point of a spin-off, isn't it? The game goes out of its way to tell you it's not serious and that it's all just a dream, but it's still nice. There's no evil plan, there's no scheme, there's nothing. It's just a family squabble that ends in a tie, and that's funny. It's genuinely a nice time that I like to sink my teeth into. The ranking system was a bit confusing to me at first because, as far as I remember, the game never tells you how to get a Brilliant or a King Crazy, but once I figured it out, it was pretty easy to get, especially with the perks and limiters you can put on to affect your score. I didn't really bring these up because they're really just a bonus thing you can do, and unlocking them is half the fun. The only ones I put on are the Scratch Hit one, the Combo Break Ends the Song one, and the Goods Don't Break the Combo one, so I get around a 4 to 11 score increase. Otherwise, I just try to get my high score topped. What else can I say? Dancing is fun. Why not join in? Holy rework, Batman! Persona just got smacked with a hammer. Strikers is one of the newer games that bucks the turn-based aspect the series has been known for and goes for a real-time action style in the same vein as Dynasty Warriors, and woo! Look at me go! Look, Ma! Mass Carnage! This is probably my favorite game to play in the series because it's more able to be tinkered with in terms of how you go about it in each playthrough. The only constant is Joker. Everything else is up to you and what team setup you want. Sure, there's clearly a good setup for each jail, but it's not like you have to stick with it. If you want, you can completely ignore everyone and do a Joker-only run or pick three of your faves and make them unkillable gods. That's this game's biggest strength, versatility. I know, shocking given my track record, but it's true. It lets you do with 
move you want, how you want to do it. One big draw to me is that you don't lose your abilities when you level up. Now you just swap them and can pick and choose later if you find you need a weaker ability for SP consumption or just want to put on more passive abilities. Speaking of those, let's talk about the game's new mechanics outside of combat before we get to that. So there's this thing you get for doing story missions, side quests, friend quests, or just random boss raids called bond points. Just like the characters, there's an EP meter for bond points that, when leveled up, gives you some kind of amount of bond points which can be spent on things like persona stat buffs, team overall HP limit, experience gained, and buffs from the food or items you buy. These things can range from really cheap to really expensive, but it depends on the player's level and what level the thing you're trying to buy is and what row it's on going from cheapest at the top to most expensive on the bottom. While this system is fun and a good way to make the gameplay loop more engaging given its perk system, it becomes annoying when you have to redo the same missions over and over again to level up the bomb meter to 99 because every bond point is accounted for and to get the achievement you have to get every part to its max level and it's so time consuming. If you don't care about achievements then it's a perfectly fine system, and you don't need every single perk even on Merciless, it just makes the game less of a hassle the more you upgrade. Speaking of upgrades, there are these items you can give to any persona Joker has and they buff specific stats, and if you get enough of them you can take even Arsene and buff him to have perfect stats, and uh... Yeah, it's fun. Not only that, but you can teach him higher level curse moves so that he's not outdone by most other things in the game. One thing this game has over the original and even Royal is its timeline. Given how this is a summer vacation road trip with the whole gang, everything is a bit expedited to keep things at a rapid pace. So rather than having you leave the palace and that be it for the day, they make it so that you can leave the jail and immediately come back with your SP and HP at full. They know it's going to take a lot to get through these and they can't just make you do it in one go, especially with the way the narrative will have you leave a few times, but much less than in the first game and for much less annoying reasons. The game also does this thing where whatever city you're in has little food requests from your friends or has them want an item from a shop and it humanizes them so much. One problem the original game's narrative had was that the gang only ever hung out for plot things rather than just because they wanted to be friends. Even On and Ryuji who have been friends for years never so much as got a burger or something together. I know why this is. It's because they had to give the player as many chances to see whatever member they wanted to see at any given time, but it's still feels weird, like these guys are all friends from anywhere from a year to two months and while theoretically they could have spent every day together punching demons in the face, but they don't. And it leaves very little in the way of their unique dynamics because we have to have Joker be the center of attention since he's the player. In Strikers, since we're all traveling together and have to be in the same place, it's assumed the player already knows these characters, so they get to play around with the placement of who gets to spend time with who and what each person's jail equivalent is meant for in their side quests. Not to mention, much like in Royal, we only have two new main characters and the villain to introduce, and she's more of an afterthought till the plot twist reveal, which I'll get to in a moment. But I spent enough time beating around the bush, let's get to the narrative and how it's tied into gameplay, shall we? So in this game, palaces are now called jails, and they cover an entire city in Japan rather than a building in Shibuya. This leaves a lot more ground for our thieves to cover, and because of this massive scale, the dev team decided to make the game as roomy and fun to explore as they could. The jails function in almost the same and yet completely different ways than the base game. Yes, there is a ruler and they taunt our heroes and all that jazz, but here, they steal the hearts of people and that causes them to become devout followers. For Alice, this was spending every yen they had on her merch, for Natsumi was buying up all of his books, Books. For Haido, it was doing everything for the city, even if it meant your health or life. Akira wanted to be your hero and made himself... Well, basically, he's Tony Stark pre-Civil War. The functionality of the jails is to gain followers and further the true villain's plans. It's kind of like the Mafia in a way. You have the bosses, then you have the Familia, and then you have the people under the heads of the house, all the way down to the grunts. And yes, this is a JoJo's reference, thank you for noticing. The stealing of hearts being flipped on us to show how it looks on the outside is a good critique of the first game's narrative, in that we know what we're doing is right, but the public has no idea. And while the Monarch's goals aren't terrible, they aren't altruistic either. So it's still an obvious right and wrong, but the concept itself is really well thought out to allow the player and the characters to feel the right amount of irony in the whole thing, especially since Royal and Strikers came out in about the same time frame as this game does from Royal's story ending. That's another thing, this game can't reference anything to do with Kasumi because they can't know if the players experienced that, so they just don't bother with it, and only use Vanillify's plot as a jumping off point, which I think was a missed opportunity. I mean, I get it, but not one of these assholes going, Hey, doesn't Sophie remind you of Yoshizawa? At any point in this narrative was a shot not fired and it bugs me. Get out of here, you demonic teddy bear. Anyway, enough exposition. Let's get into what makes these jails so fun. 
First things first, real time action combat baby! This shit is so fun to control. The combo system is rather basic, each character gets the same combos no matter what. You just have to play with that character more to unlock all of them, which lets you use their affinities and abilities a lot more, and even mix their persona in for no extra SP cost. For example, On has fire as her main gimmick. If you hit triangle, her whip gets lit on fire. If you do a certain combo, whether it's lit or not, Carmen comes out and does a little mini fire blast, and every character gets this kind of treatment. Makoto has a combo where she summons Yohana and just does a wheelie on a shadow's face, and it's great. Oh, another cool thing this game does is that while there are Persona that appear from the shadow you rip the mask off of, there are also just normal shadow enemies like guards, cops, and helicopters for some reason? The series makes no sense, but damn it all if it isn't fun. Certain shadows have been made into sort of mini-bosses, and that's not really a change from the base game. Hell, some shadows have the same shadow in the mini-boss fight, and I have no questions because it makes crowd control easier. While on that topic, the way this game's combat works is more of an area of an effect cone that appears in front of you when you select the spell. They kinda had to nix the idea of a single or multi-target attack, so they went for a narrow or wide range of effect, and that's really good. It means that your spells aren't any less effective, it just makes SP management more viable mid-game. Not to mention the fact you can heal and regen stuff mid-fight by pausing, otherwise this game would have been way harder. Oh, also, items carry over a new game plus, so if you play on safe mode and then jump to Merciless, you have way more healing options in your back pocket, plus more things to sell in the shop. The combat is so fun in this game, it makes the repetitive nature and similar feeling areas in the same jail go by faster because you're punching a demon dog in the face, and who won't love that? This all ties into the Showtime mechanic, which has been reworked from Royal, where in that game it was a team attack between two specific party members, here though it's between that person and their persona, and they can really change the tide of battle if you have the right ones at the right time. They're basically big attacks that start with a cutscene, but they look cool, don't interrupt gameplay too much, and all have unique animations that can decimate groups in a single go if you get the right angle on it. The jails themselves do have cool little interactable things to work with in terms of stunning enemies, or doing massive fuck off damage to a mini boss since they're typically tailored to its weakness, which is smart level design in general. Alright, that's enough gameplay, let's talk about the story. So again, palaces are jails now, and the area they cover is big enough for a whole city this go around. Each jail has a ruler called a monarch, rather than a warden, which I guess would have narrowed the theme a tad to just cops, but I digress. Much like the base game, these jails relate to our cast in specific ways. The only one who doesn't get one is Morgana, but I suppose he gets the Okinawa jail with Ryuji, and even then that wants more about Sophie. Anyway, On gets Alice, Yusuke gets Natsumi, Haru gets Haidu, Makoto and Zenkichi get a Kane, and Ren gets Akira. Hey, I see what you did there, Atlas. Fuck you. These all line up with either a person in their same industry like Alice with On or Yusuke and Natsumi, both sets of being artists with either their body or their minds, or they're related to that person, be it an extended family member or a blood relative. The only one that doesn't fit that is Akira with Ren, and that's because Akira is meant to echo Shido in his goals, motives, and attitude, but also be a parallel to the Phantom Thieves by trying to do good in a massively wrong way, whereas we're just illegal, but eh, semantics. I think all the jail monarchs are super well done. The way it's doled out and how their backstory is given to us is more compelling because we don't know who it is initially. Then when we find out, we more have to figure out what they want, then get a password which then lets us get to the tragic backstory. This is a far cry from the base game, where there they were just bastards for the sake of being bastards. Which, yeah, that's fun in its own right, but I never cared when we found them in the depths of Mementos because they were just like that. The only one I even remotely cared about besides Sai was Okumura, and they killed him off for the shock value of it all. And I only really cared because of Haru, but she's handling it like Clara before her, so even then it's tempered. Here, all of these people have a motive to be this way, and were twisted by Emma to do it, and I like that so much more. They seem more repentant, they want to make up for it and not be forgiven with no punishment. And yeah, the base game did that too, but again, bastards. So... The plot of the game is less intricate than the base game, because they have actual less in-game time to flesh it out. The base game was more about just doing day-to-day -day anime things, with arcs going on each month. Whereas here, it's one long mystery with many arcs that lead us to the culprit, and if I'm being honest, when I first played the game, I was legit shocked at the real bad guy. Even the Emma twists threw me a bit, as she's been with you longer than Sophia. Sophia is an AI that was found in the Shibuya jail by Joker or Yuji, and if I'm being honest, 
I love her. I seem to have a thing for wide-eyed girls named Sophia, don't I? What I love about her is that she genuinely wants to fulfill her programming, and to do that, she joins the Phantom Thieves to become humanity's companion, and from there learns what it means to have a heart and to be a person. She cries, she laughs, she sings, she learns, she fights, she strives, she asks questions. She just is a character, and tries to be what she was asked to be, but also becomes her own person in the process, and it's just pure. Her persona being Pandora is one of the coolest reveals in the game, not only for how it's done, Done, her screaming the name will never not be amazing, <laughs> but also that it's just one of those in plain sight things as her persona is just a bunch of floating boxes in the beginning of a game, and from there they stack on top of each other and form into Pandora. They not only go from being part of her programming to being a first and second awakening all in one scene, it's great writing. Sophia is also directly tied to both antagonists, as she was the prototype to Emma that their creator Koan Ichinose discarded when Sophia started asking questions and didn't understand the concept of a heart, thus billing Emma to be less emotional and more able to take straightforward instructions while still learning. Basically a female coded HAL 9000. Ichinose herself I find to be the most emotionally charged villain out of the what? 20 we have so far? She created her daughters to understand the human heart because she was told her entire life she wasn't human for not showing emotion and being glued to her computer, when in reality all she was doing was trying to learn empathy in a way she could understand. So once she grew up, she started masking more and being able to put on a pretty smile so people would buy her tech and she could live as normal a life as she could. Ichinose does have a heart, and she does feel things. She had just bought the lie that neurotypical society told her about herself, and thus tried to build programs that could help her understand it better, but thought one failed and then created Yaldabaoth 2.0. I'll get back to the family in White's Dilemma in a second. Let's get back to Black for a moment, shall we? I've neglected Zenkichi up until this point, only naming him and his daughter Akane in the same breath once. The reason for that is that he didn't fit anywhere but here, since he and Sophie need their own time to shine. Zenkichi Hasegawa is the detective brought on the case looking into the recent batch of mental ships in Japan, and he stumbles onto them almost immediately. Smooth move there, guys. Anyway, he's this game's Sojiro, a dad struggling to connect with his daughter after the loss of her mother. The big difference is that he's never there because of work, rather than her shutting herself away. Zenkichi wants to do right by Akane and loves her very much, he's just struggling to find the words to reach her, which is where Makoto comes in. She's been in this exact situation, so she helps smooth things over, even does homework with Akane. They all have dinner together, and the gang sits in on her livestream about the Phantom Thieves as she's a massive fan of theirs. Her channel isn't anything super fun to me, like, I like the poor and all, but it feels like they knew if it was any longer, the game would drag, as this is also Zenkichi's Awakening, and there's a stealth section at the start of it, along with the length of the jail, makes the portals of being in on themselves and backtracking take less time, as it's a bit of a go here hit the button type of place. I mean, hey, a kid made this place and it was a rather on the fly plan by Akira, I'm not too mad about it. I will say the boss fight's cool, I love clone fights, though it sucks you're stuck as Joker for this, rather than being able to pick whichever thief you want just by walking in as that thief, but I get it, programming one fight as opposed to eight does make sense, still kinda blah. The designs are cool, the red hair really sells it, all the bosses' designs are great, both pre- and post-transformations. Both this and the base game have a weird Seven Deadly Sins thing going on, pride, lust, gluttony, greed, so on and so forth. I say this game is a bit more obvious about it in its theming, I mean, one of the bosses literally is a fat slob eating while the people under her suffer, but eh, it's an anime game. Subtle is not its strong suit. Zenkichi and Akane are both really strong characters, and they feel this way because we've gotten to spend so much time with him before we meet her, and when we do, we have a character who's been through this exact same situation, so it all ties together in a nice scarlet red bow. Analogy not intended, but fuck it, why not? In addition, this is also a nice parallel to our mother-daughter trio. So, Ichinose was told she had no heart, and Akane thought Zenkichi didn't either, both over losing a loved one, and it took outside counsel to show that they do have a heart and they have value, which speaks to how people grieving or trying to improve themselves can be hindered if they aren't given proper support. Emma really embodies all of this, because while she and Yaldabaoth both have the same general theming and even their designs are similar, I don't really care because how they were created and got their powers is completely different. Yaldabaoth was created by the masses and wanted to be worshipped, so took away their free will to achieve it, freeing them from strife for his benefit. Emma was tasked with being humanity's companion, and with her vast network up and running, she was able to consolidate the data she had gotten from people and made it so that she can give the people what they had shown her, the ability to not have to worry or think. 
Convenience was her gift at the cost of their autonomy. Again, very similar, but very different. Persona 5 on the whole has this theme of taking back your life, of self-autonomy and free will. From its color palette, to its music, to its antagonists, to its main character, taking back what society has stolen from you is something that most people can relate to and want. Which is why an unthinking machine doing it because it was told to, but without the heart that her older sister was able to grow, changed so much of what she was that she's the perfect villain for a metaphor of consumerism and capitalism. The people took advantage of the convenience she offered the second it was available, even us. Remember, Sophie is in our phone using Emma, doing illegal shit so that we can get stuff same day black market delivery, so even we aren't blameless, and that's what makes it so poignant. We saw we were part of the problem and then helped to correct the problem, which is what people need to realize in general about the real world now. Strikers isn't a one-to-one -one stand in for the real world, but stories aren't meant to be that. They're meant to make us understand and make sense of the real world and light a fire in us. And I'll be damned if this game's themes don't do that on some level for me. The only area this game stumbles in for me is Lavenza. I said I'd talk about her in Strikers, and well, this is where she goes. I fucking hate Lavenza. She's got what I call Garnet's disease, a term I made up to describe a character comprised of two definitively different personalities that only takes traits from the calmer one. Caroline and Justine are my favorite parts of the persona aspect of the game. Because they're so fun and engaging, they make me laugh. They're weird and strange and just funny to be around. I like seeing them, I get excited to interact with them, and I felt just genuine emotion when they had their confidant arc. So I was a bit surprised when they decided to kill off the best characters and splice them into a slightly taller version of Justine with a book. Seriously, that's all she is. Whatever aspect of Caroline was put into her was suffocated. And no, her boss fight doesn't count because she's still just as calm as ever. I saved her for Strikers because she's on her own here. She has to stand on her own two feet as a Velvet Attendant, and I'm honestly sure that Theodore would do a better job of keeping my attention at this point. There's no warmth, no personality, no nothing to her as a character. She just has this blank look in her eyes and a breathy voice to make me want to stab her with my god knife. She doesn't get to be a character in any regard till maybe the third semester in Royal because Igor's actor died and they didn't want to pony up for the new guy, and even then she doesn't really stand out, she's more just repeating the same information over and over again, and I just don't care. From what I've seen of her siblings, she's the least engaging and least interesting of the four, and the only thing she gets out of this is a single foot stamp when one of her sisters joins her song in Starlight. That's her only bit of personality, guys. So for her to carry the second best game of the series, it's just bullshit to me. I mean, this is her introduction. My name? is Lavenza. I was torn apart by a malevolent will and took the form of those twins. And that's all she gets! Yes, I understand why. It's because it's the finale and we gotta wrap this shit up. Ah, pardon me for not introducing the others. To your right is Caroline. To your left, Justine. They serve as wardens here. Ha! Try and struggle as hard as you like! The duty of wardens is to protect inmates. We are also your collaborators. That is, if you remain obedient. But damn, you could have made her a tad more engaging in Strikers or just split her up again like in Starlight. If I had my way, I would have kept the twins and let them be their weird, wacky selves. Despite that glaring issue, P5 Strikers is a fun hack and slash Dynasty Warriors-esque title that allows us to go on a fun road trip with the gang, see some genuinely great interactions, and make new friends along the way. I laughed. I cried. Thank you all. I promise. I won't forget you or our time together. Huh. We'll meet again. I screamed in delight. Belgium! And I felt things for the different people who had been through so much and just wanted to make a name for themselves or atone for past mistakes, showing us that true self-reflection isn't beyond us and owning up to things will only make others respect you more. This game's themes, tone, and story won't be timeless, but for good reason. It's what we need here and now, so hopefully it'll be outdated in the future for good reason. And if not, then it'll help us punch the god of complacency in the face over and over and over again. And none of this would be remotely as fun without our leading wildcard.
Ren Amamiya, Akira Kurosu, Joker. These are the names of one boy falsely arrested and sent to live with a family friend for a year and are the names of the kid who saves Tokyo, his found family, and when you really get down to it, THE WORLD! Joker, as a character, is nothing super remarkable at face value. He's a silent protagonist meant to be the median in which the player interacts with the game's world, which is really the job of any silent protag or any protag in general. But as Pokemon and even Bug Snacks so often demonstrate when this trope isn't implemented carefully, it can be jarring. Ren is essentially a link from Zelda. He has dialogue options, but everything he does is set in stone. You must go through the adventure on a set path, regardless of your feelings on the matter. This is why, while I understand the problem with a protagonist that has two little character, the complaint that a character has too much personality or isn't the right character baffles me. When I talked about Sora, kind of like I'm doing right here, with Sora, I said his personality comes through in his little things. All the moments along the way really make his character shine in almost every scene he's in. Joker is something in between. He's got a definite personality and he has a consistent through line in how he wants to tackle things, and little moments do add up, but for the bulk of the adventure, he's not going to be saying much. The game relies on the other characters to do the heavy lifting while he just stands there. I understand and this is so that we can feel like we're the ones waiting, and our dialogue options are what matter in these scenes, but it still creates a bit of a tonal dissonance for me. Ren has moments of self-reflection and being aware of people's feelings. He thinks about how he better approach things what might be a right or wrong decision, and while I get that this is for the player's benefit so he can understand or be reminded of something, it all goes a long way to explain who he is as a character. He's also a really caring person. As someone who's been the emotional rock for people in my life, I can say this is true to life and how things are tackled. He's there for them in a big moment moment, gets them through it, and then you just kind of shoot the shit for a while and part ways for the day. It's nice, and kind of true to life, as odd as that sounds for this game. The romances function like this as well. Joker has a pretty even amount of time spent with both men and women in the game, and has about the same level of depth with all of them. The only difference is, is that the women are all infatuated with you all of a sudden because you were apparently the only man within a hundred miles who didn't try to abuse, fuck, or hit on them the instant you saw them. So that's something. While that depressing reality sets in, and the fact that it's true to life as well, especially in Japan, it's just weird how the game doesn't even let you ask out the men around you. None of them seem like they'd be bad options to date, and the only really weird one would be Sojiro, since he's your dad in the game, which is a constant thing with the Sakuras in this thing I'm noticing. Obviously Shinya isn't in this because he's like 10, so don't think I'm throwing him in here, I'm not, because ew. The other male characters though? I don't see a problem, and as a man who likes men, I like that option in a game that purports to let you play it your way. I know I just went into how the little moments of his character make him more than Link or Elio or Red, but that doesn't mean that I, as the player, shouldn't get to live out the social sim aspect in a way I see fit. Hell, I do get to do that, just not with the person I want to lay in bed with. And you cannot tell me that these two are straight, you just can't, I simply will not believe you. This one's got chaotic dumbass bi vibes, and Yusuke is about as pan as it gets, and he is most definitely into his weird side and his femininity. Not saying that he's femme, but the fact that he can sit there and be so emotionally vulnerable, and is willing to be outside the norm is just giving me non-het vibes here, guys. I just... I... Ugh. Do you guys mind if I tangent? I promise I'm going somewhere with this, just stick with me here. There's a mobile game set 10 years before the events of the Harry Potter books called Hogwarts Mystery. In this game, you get to pick your own house and make a character that does whatever you want them to do in this place. So long as the plot objectives are met, the game doesn't care what you do. You have classes, story events, side events, timed events, dueling, creature care, and eventually, yes, even dating the other original characters. There are, as of time of writing, eight romantic options, and you unlock them through the story. The only one you technically start with is your rival, Merla Snide, and from there, you get the other seven from the story unfolding. And the great thing is that you don't have to date anyone. But if you do, it's a completely optional side thing that informs their characters. The first date option is in Hagrid's Hut, and you have to complete three out of five minigames to fill the romance meter. There's a right, semi-right, and a wrong answer. Get all three right, you get the most points. Get all wrong, you get nothing, and so on and so forth. We'll use my favorite character in the game and my least favorite romance option as examples. Barnaby Lee, who I first read as Bramby, so that's just what I call him, is a creature-loving Slytherin boy who's got about five brain cells to rub together, and four of them are about creatures. In the date, you appeal to his love of animals and plants, and he's smitten. Pet the dog, pick thistles, pick pumpkins, tell him that you'd be making friends, and that you tell him the truth that this wasn't going well, and he's a happy boy. All things I also agree with in a date. I like Brandy as a character, and I bonded with him over the time I played this game. The other example is Jay Kim, a great friend and a wonderful trickster, but we aren't compatible. He wants to scare Fang, he doesn't want to pick flowers or pumpkins, and he'd rather make trouble than be alone or make friends, which could 
say something about his insecurities, but the point is that he's just not my type. Some people might be into that, but I, personally, am not. I've tried dating the girls in the game as well, and while I love Penny to bits, we're more study buddies than anything. Bramby is a character I've grown to care about. Every romantic special event I've done with him. He was my character's first kiss, first dance, all of that. They've been a thing as long as I've known the lovable idiot, and the events always let you pick who you want to do these things with. Hell, there was just a summer festival one year and he was still my date. Oh, and they reference stuff from past events if you keep picking the same person. Like, multiple characters will tease you and poke fun like, wow, you're really into him, aren't you? Along with all of this, your character talks a lot. They have their own thoughts and personalities, and while you can't influence where the conversation will go, you can make choices that feel real and like you affect the plot around you. This game even has a stat building system. It's not as complicated as Personas, but you get knowledge, empathy, and courage. Essentially, logos, pathos, and ethos, and that can affect how fast you can level up friendships or even what dialogue options you can pick, which is similar to this series and is, in fact, why this tangent is here in the first place. Why bring all this up? Well, the idea I'm trying to convey is that we have a fully fleshed out character that still has agency, can talk freely with everyone, has good, solid friendships with people, and can date anyone the player wants, provided their bond is deep enough. My point is, why is this mobile, free-to-play game able to give this as an option to a select handful of your friends, but a $60, 120-hour-long trek through comic book Tokyo made by a major company not allowed to do the same? I don't see a difference here. Even if you only made your friends dateable, that would fix this gripe I have. My Hogwarts character is technically pansexual. He can love anyone I choose for him, and while he is me, I can make him look or act in whatever way I want, and I have no issue with that because I'm aware that there are people that aren't like me and would only want to be straight or lesbian or a slash arrow and not date anyone or simply don't care. But I, as a romantic person, want to choose who my character dates in ways I'd want. There's no reason the game has gay dialogue options, aside from having the funny haha gay panic jokes from your male friends, and that's just sad to me. Just write a bisexual lead already. If you're gonna leave every other choice to the player, let us have this one as well. Make the whole cast buy and be done with it, and for good measure, make the protagonist a gender select option. Just call them they the whole time and you won't have to rewrite every interaction. Boom. Problem solved. And yes, I want to date all the eligible boys in this game. Mishima is best boy, and I will protect him with my way too extravagant knife if you so much as look at him sideways. Ren is a solidly written character. He doesn't talk much, but when he does, it only amplifies his actions. He's strong-willed, knows what's right, and is willing to put himself on the line to get things done if need be. He's a bit sassy and a tad blunt, but it's not like he doesn't care. He's just not one for long, eloquent speeches on things. One of the best examples comes from On's confidant, where he tells her straight up that her berating herself isn't going to make her feel better, and certainly won't help her get better than Mika. It's all up to her, and while her friends will help her as best they can, she's the one that has to stand on her own two feet. He also shows Makoto how to be a real teenager and cut back, so she doesn't have to push herself harder than she feels is right. Ryuji gets revenge on the man who's hurting his former friends, Yusuke finds his inner inspiration again, Futaba meets with an old friend and becomes more sociable, Haru mourns her father and learns to run a company while also branching out and pursuing her passions, Sophie learning to be a person and even feeling like more than her programming, all things we help them do, all actions Ren did on his own without being prompted or asked, just because he cares. The inciting incident of the plot is that he tried to stop Shido from assaulting a girl for God's sake. He's not a bad person by any stretch of the imagination. He's just a nice kid who has a bit of a less than sunny disposition, and that's okay. I've said it before, delivery is important, but the more time you spend with someone, the more you learn the nuances of their speech, and how on the outside a simple, that's rough buddy, really means, I'm so sorry, you want to talk about it? And that's friendship in a nutshell to me. Joker isn't a completely stellar character at first glance, but once you look beneath the mask, I think you'll find someone who will easily steal your heart. Persona 5 is a series with many, many peaks and a 
damn sight far too many valleys, but what it lacks in some areas, it makes up for in others. While the combat can be a tad easy and somewhat repetitive, the music more than makes up for it. While the puzzles aren't super complex every step of the way, the more thought out dungeon floor plan allows for more consistent themes to be expanded on. While not every villain is a winner, the character they are attached to is so much more than they appear. And while not every single social link rank is super engaging, the time spent with these lovely people will never not be worth it, even if you're just playing a round of laser guns. Something I feel never gets talked about with these games is the aspect of player input, and while you get to choose what the protagonist does all day and night, and how that can affect things, the story being as linear and as structured as it is, leaves it up to a checklist when you get down to it. I mean, yeah, on a standard new game plus you can just start a confidant and then get all the perks, focus on your party members, get their second awakenings, and just trophy hunt, but otherwise, your time from April to Christmas is book solid, which, I mean, too much structure is probably better than not enough structure, at least to me. If a game says, hey, here's an open world, my brain just freezes. There's so many options, I don't know what to do. So I end up just kind of sweeping the map in a given direction until I get stuck and then head somewhere else. Persona 5 just doesn't do that. It has enough content that it makes sense when and where you get things, and how those things are given from a narrative sense. Some other things are questionable, but in general, it's handled pretty well. Characters are often talked about, but I feel it's where this series shines the best. The only character I straight up didn't like was fixed by way of iteration, and has become one of my favorites because of this weird anti-hero journey he's gone through. My favorite character from the base game only got better as time went on. My favorite palace ruler took me playing the base game three times in a row to be able to see. My favorite palace only got better with time, and I thought the latest game was charming overall, and that's largely due to Sophie. That's the weird thing about having this series get so many iterations in less than half a decade. It allows us to see what about these characters we liked, and how the team behind them was able to tweak them, making them more well received as time has gone on. It's almost like remakes in a way. Pokemon also has this thing for its enhanced versions, but to a lesser extent, besides like Black and White 2 or Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon, which added so much to them and radically changed so many things, they didn't fit with say Pokemon Yellow or Emerald. But with a remake, you can take on critiques from an older title and incorporate that into how the new one is being made, and it's just one of those things that's hard to grapple with on some level, but it's still fascinating to ponder. Oh god, what's Nomura gonna do when they get around to remaking the OG numbered titles? That's a scary thought. What makes the P5 series so engaging is just how you feel the growth. Not just from the start to end, but through each installment something new is added to make them feel like even when the story doesn't matter, or is reset, you're rewarded for going through the journey again. The show added more time with people, before and after their main points in-game. Royal added more depth to them by way of Maruki, Dancing showed their inner insecurities and wild sides, and Strikers showed how the whole team functions from a low-stakes scenario to the world ending again, which putting everyone in the equivalent of Kamashita's palace was a smart idea, and led to great new ways of introducing the team as we went. If I had to solidify the series into one word, it would be stunning. Even though not every single thing is going to be perfect, and not every single palace is the best thing ever, it's not like any game has that. Even one of my favorites has some mess sections, just like some great shows have met episodes or arcs, or movies have scenes you just kinda wanna skip. But that's just how it is. What matters is it's not unbearably bad, or that you can't find some joy in the mess. And I can certainly do that with all five of these entries. Hey look at that, that wasn't even on purpose. I have one more nitpick with the series, and that's that I wish it would have taken more risks. I already brought up the romance thing, but maybe branch away from the high school life, or set this in a different country, or I don't know, let the main characters kill people and let it be more in a grey area. I know that's odd coming from me, but I think in this set of circumstances they could have made it so that we have to kill someone because even a change of heart didn't work, proving Akechi's point in some ways, that in order to enact change, you have to get your hands a little red. Not cold-blooded murder, but just a kill would have added a touch to this, I think. But the series is still fun in its own right, make no mistake. No other series has the level of boldness this one does. It doesn't have crazy effects or transformations all the time. It's just a really bold, striking set of stories that make you care about the world you've been brought to. And after all, who wouldn't want to steal a heart or two? My name is Chris, make sure you wake up, get up, get out there with your colors flying high, and stay groovy so we can break in and break out again because you are stronger than the things that made you weak. And I hope you have a fractal Fantastic day.